good afternoon good afternoon everyone good afternoon our respected panel of speakers our principal dr ratnakar pani our vice principal professor pk roy friends senior colleagues and all our listeners i professor piali seth from the department of political science and the convener of this webinar on behalf of our esteemed institution profullo chandra college in collaboration with the internal quality assurance cell iqac heartily welcome all of you to this webinar titled environmentalism issues of sustainability and public participation human caused environmental changes are creating regional combinations of environmental conditions and transformations that has already in the past shown significant changes in the environment including temperature rise sea level rise rate of carbon emissions and many more such variables it eventually and unavoidably takes us the humans outside the envelope within which we have been accustomed to think respond and act this webinar does wishes to highlight the role impact as well as the involvement of humans in this gradual onset of environmental changes that has been affecting the human society in its various ramifications since long a critically reviewed analysis of environmentalism and work related to environmental protection in the context of public participation especially with regard to the issues of sustainability takes us to the challenges of climate resilient adaptation lack of technical expertise and financial resources governance transformation and also to the paradox of democratic participation this webinar was conceptualized with the purpose to address these gaps with the help of the views as will be expressed and discussed by our expert panel of speakers from across the fields of science and technology social science and the civil society may i now kindly request our respected principal dr ratnakar pani to say a few words and formally inaugurate this webinar sir thank you priyali good afternoon thank you, sir i welcome all the participants to this webinar i specially welcome our distinguished speakers professor abhijit kundu dr shaurish jha dr orijit kumar das uh, to this webinar let me first congratulate the department of political science and internal quality assurance cells of our college for organizing this relevant webinar on a burning and contemporary issue environmentalism issues of sustainability and public participation as a prologue to this ensuing discussion in today's webinar i would like to raise certain issues that uh, that are globally concerned in today's world is it visible yes you can continue carry on sir uh yes so the major issues that are relevant today is depletion of natural resources high growth in pollution plastic almost wrapping the earth surface human life at high risk politics among contrary now let us 
discuss about the non renewable renewable uh, resources non renewable natural resources are depleting at accelerating rate over time reported by the guardian.com now if we look at the water level by 2025 it is projected that 1.8 billion people will face absolute fresh water scarcity if we talk about oil proven reserve only meet less than 50 years demand similarly gas will last within 60 years phosphorus will last within 100 years and coal will last within 190 years if we look at the global emission growth the pollution level right now is 46.1 gigaton in 2016 data it's gradually growing from 30 gigaton in 1990 to 46.1 gigaton in 2016 the major source of pollution is the energy uh, industry now if we look at the plastic problem the it is almost wrapping the entire global surface now if we look at the data uh, in nine uh, started from 1950 within 65 years the growth is so much it it's around 322 million tons of plastics were produced worldwide in 2015 so it is consumed and we throw it uh, to the earth surface so it's uh, causing a major problem now if this continues let us project the our uh, so please share your ppt i have shared na no sir it has not come it is not uh, showing no sir is it shared now yes sir now it is okay okay now let us just imagine what is going on in the earth in next few uh, years or centuries uh, just imagine in a very simple diagrammatic form let us take Uh, y axis as the population population pressure on environment and environmental quality and on the x axis uh, and let us take the time period now initially before human being came to the earth nature had a uh, gift of nature natural quality of environment let us take that quality as natural environmental quality now as the human population increases it created lot of pressure on uh, environment initially the pressure was very low uh, with the uh, development of economy the pressure uh, escalated uh, to a high rate now we know when uh, the environment uh, we talk about uh, there is a uh, auto immune system within the environment it can restore some uh, of the pressure we create on the environment let uh, that is the restoration capacity of the environment uh, it also decreases as the population pressure increases let us uh, imagine when the uh, population pressure goes beyond the restoration capacity of the environment what happens the environmental natural quality deteriorates actual quality of the environment deteriorates like this now if we uh, imagine a level where human being can sustain its life that means uh, every human being needs 
certain quality of environment to uh, life within it uh, so let us take the sustainable environmental quality uh, like this and uh, then what happens when the actual environmental quality scores uh, below the sustainable environmental quality people will die so naturally the pressure will fall rapidly this process will continue uh, till the pressure goes below the restoration capacity uh, when the pressure of human being goes below the restoration capacity of the environment uh, environmental uh, quality curve again improves and it goes uh, above the uh, uh, sustainable environmental quality then only the human being they will stop and again human being will rise with along with its pressure this is just an indicative type of curve uh, nothing more has been uh, elaborately taken in this diagram uh, we are just uh, uh, imagine what will happen if we continue this pressure on environment now the cycle is complete when once again the environmental quality curve uh, goes uh, above the sustainable environmental quality curve so now question arises should we allow this type of uh, environmental deterioration and face the problem that we are going to uh, uh, experience in near future the question is no then what to do we have to do something suppose we are at the point p right now environmental quality has deteriorated to some extent and we have this much pressure on uh, environment so we can take different policies we may take three types of policies number one is very aggressive policy just like uh, few days before when corona virus uh, uh, become exploded in the world the entire uh, world uh, thought about the complete lockdown that means we uh, stop everything and we will be blocked in the uh, room similar type of uh, action we may think about in case of the environment we just withdraw the entire uh, pressure on the environment so we can take this aggressive uh, uh, kind of action and uh, so naturally the environment quality curve will uh, rapidly improve and it will go back to its uh, natural environmental quality line if we take this kind of aggressive activities what will happen just like the corona uh, lockdown people will starve so we cannot afford that so we may take uh, some kind of uh, we can allow some activities so that uh, it can sustain human uh, population in the world and we can take a, a moderate policy and we can uh, stop all other uh, economic activities just to sustain the entire population the activities needed we can allow them so what will happen uh, little slower but the environmental quality curve again improve and it will go back to its natural quality instead of that we can take a convenient policy that means we will just stop the irrelevant work the superfluous activities of human being all the necessary activities we can continue at the same time we will emphasize on research and development work to change our technology to change our consumption pattern change our lifestyle so that we can uh, easily uh, uh, get all the benefits from the environment but in a restricted form and we change the entire technological world so that we will uh, create less pressure on the environment environment is in a slower but uh, it will certainly improve and uh, go back to its natural quality and we can think about all these things so now the entire world is working on it and the entire environmental work in all the disciplines are now going on in this field so 
for this purpose what is needed is a uh, global uh, commitment and uh, all the uh, countries in the world should join hands together to uh, face this type of problem and mitigate this problem instead of that what is going on internationally a lot of politics is going on so we can uh, we can see that environmental matters have become central to contemporary international politics what is going on developed countries are always entrusting the responsibility on the developing countries saying that uh, these countries are very poor they are backward they are they are using obsolete technologies that is why they are detrimenting the environment they are the main responsible countries on the other hand the developing countries saying no 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 that is not the real situation the real situation is uh, uh, the developed countries due to huge production and consumption they are detrimenting the to enter uh, environment and the environmental quality is deteriorating day by day so to bring all together the united nations have uh, arranged several conferences starting from stockholm 1972 uh, till today but no remarkable result achieved till today we cannot find any uh, very uh, remarkable uh, uh, achievement from any country throughout the world only thing we can notice that the developed countries through globalization to economic liberalization they have damped the dirty boots in developing countries particularly the aggressive fast growing countries like india china uh, uh, south uh, africa etc so this cannot uh, they are trying to avoid their pollution their all the environmental problem by pushing these goods to the developing countries but experts say this will not work in long term because the air is open the water is open they have no geographic boundary so they flow across the countries the pollution of one country always affect other countries therefore this type of tactics will not uh, work so i will not uh, 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 speak more today because i am not supposed to do that Uh, we are more interested in uh, la- uh, listening from our experts uh, who are waiting for a long time so i will conclude this uh, uh, speech by uh, saying that uh, this uh, subject cannot be uh, uh, discussed in one webinar or one day uh, i think as uh, the expert will highlight some of the areas of this uh, uh, contemporary issues yes, so before that i uh, thank uh, all our participants our experts and our organizing teams i welcome them to part, uh, join this seminar and uh, i thank you all and i conclude my session with you thank you so much sir for your valuable insights on this alarming issue of sustainability and environmental protection now may i kindly request professor dr shonali roy the coordinator of the internal quality assurance cell of our college to please share her thoughts regarding this webinar ma'am yes can you see me can you hear me thank you piyali good evening ladies and gentlemen today we all are here to join the international webinar environmentalism issues of sustainability and public participation 
organized by the Department of Political Science and IQSC, Prafula Chandra College. I, Shonali Rai, coordinator of IQSC, Prafula Chandra College, convey my hearty welcome to all of you. Environmentalism or environmental rights became a philosophy and ideology in the last five decades. And it also turned into a social movement. But all these are not sufficient. The question of pollution, the question of global warming, and the politics involved with that always disturbed us. In today's highly developed world, mankind requires more awareness to preserve the surroundings for the future generations. Before 1972, people around the world were not much conscious about their concerns and responsibilities regarding the environment around them. The first environmental conference at Stockholm in 1972 highlighted the symbiotic relations between environmental protection, all-round development, and the well-being of mankind. Since then, several international agreements, including Rio Declaration, stated that the participation of citizens is very important to develop the awareness. This, the this webinar will highlight the importance of achieving sustainable environmental goals, along with active engagement of citizens citizens which is bound to increase awareness building activity today we are fortunate to have with us professor obhijit kundu <coughs> dr shorish jha and dr orijit dash all of them are eminent experts in the field of this environmental studies i firmly believe that our learned speakers will enlighten us through the, their valuable lectures in the course of this webinar. I hope you all will enjoy today's talk. Before I conclude, I must convey my gratitude to our convener, Professor Piali Shet, and joint convener, Professor Bhaskar Balman. They have taken the responsibilities and the burden, and so that the program is going on. Thank you all. Please enjoy. Thank you, Piali. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for your kind words. I would now like to uh, take the pleasure to introduce Professor Pritish Kumar Roy. Professor Rai is the vice principal of Profullo Chandra College in, and is also the head of the department, Department of Geography of the same college. Professor Rai has authored books such as Economic Geography and the Appraisal of Resources, which is being followed in various universities such, that, such as the JNU, and the BHU since the last three decades, apart from various other texts and reference books. I would now request Professor Rai to kindly deliver the keynote address for this webinar. Thank you, Piali. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, sir. And uh, I consider myself privileged to be associ associated with this webinar, which is uh, being organized by Department of Political Science of our college on environmentalism, issues of sustainability and public partnership. So these are the three different words. Uh, the revered speakers will elaborate on this. Just I am giving you a detail. Uh, 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 outline of these three issues actually the most widely used term is now sustainable development it is now the talk of the town everybody is now talking about this discussing about this but the term was coined in cocoa declaration in 1970 before that 
सस्टेनेबल डेवलपमेंट और सस्टेनेबिलिटी ऑन डेवलपमेंट वॉज नॉट यूज एज अ मीन्स ऑफ डेवलपमेंट इन कंटेम्पोररी वर्ल्ड सो द वर्ल्ड सस्टेनेबल डेवलपमेंट is now considered as the panacea panacea you know the medicine for all diseases we can cure everything through sustainable development that is what it seems from the discussions uh, in different webinars and seminars and all that the term sustainable development uh, was actually it's a brain child of brown plan commission which says that without compromising the use of the future generation or the requirement of uh, future generation if we use all the earthly materials in a judicious manner that is called sustainable development sustainable development the very word suggest the development which will sustain forever but uh, we man uh, we cannot call it sustainable development unless it is a prolonged development or uh, development forever so but we can raise some questions here here can we call anything sustainable is there anything sustainable in this earthly world is the earth itself is sustainable so these questions uh, comes into the mind so we are to explain all these things uh, before that before uh, sustainable development sustainable development is in fact the brain child of uh, resource crisis and depletion of resource this was a, a project undertaken by club of rome in 1978 in 1968 uh, under the leadership of dr aurelia pecky club of rome club of rome is a heterogeneous composition of uh, the leadership of societies including some technocrats some bureaucrats some scientists some economists leading economists are they are mostly from the massachusetts institute of technology mit they assemble together in uh, in a in the area academia di lenci in italy rome where they has prepared they have prepared a well drafted document that is called predicament of mankind they are, they were more concerned about the future of the art what most of the people say is that arts resources are finite we cannot use it use indiscriminately all the resources are coming out from the interior of the earth and these are finite we cannot use it forever so they prepared a, a model that is called system dynamics under the leadership of dr forester and meadows that meadows report that calls uh, uh, the report as the predicament of mankind or future of mankind so they projected it uh, as a bleak future of mankind because Uh, due to indiscriminate use of this uh, huge uh, earthly resources th there will be a day when the ha hardly we can get any uh, natural resources all the natural resources that includes minerals fuels and everything will be exhausted if this uh, rate of use indiscriminate use of this earthly resources will continue in this unabated uh, way so they uh, prepared a system dynamics and in this system dynamics they prepared uh, they uh, uh, they uh, make it a, in a eight phase run that all these runs are a different phase this all these phases are actually nothing but the development phase of human being and and the it's fallout in on environment so here comes the calculation of system dynamics computer model they have taken a computer called system 3 in that computer they all 
uh, has uh, taken all these earthly data and prepared a model which will suggest how many days this uh, all these uh, earthly resources will sustain. For example, if if the present rate of uh, consumption goes on, then uh, coal, uh, coal will last for 130 more years. Iron ore maybe 150 years. Copper maybe 20 years. So if this rate goes on unabated, then someday all earthly materials will be exhausted and future generation will be in peril. They will have no earthly resources. So there will be a disaster of a kind. So that was the philosophy of this Dennis Meadows and all that. But sustainable development says that we have to use it judiciously, keeping in mind about the need of the future generation. So in that way, we can survive. But the point is, later on in 1970s, this measure was taken, but after, after a lapse of 40 years, we, uh, we know that Earth's resources are still going on. For example, they, th they told that uh, oil resources will last for 30 years, but still we have plenty of oils. In fact, the, uh, the uh, supply of oil has increased in such a level that the prices are going down and down. That is in the bottom level. That is, in fact, unprecedented in the world history. Sometimes in the lockdown period, petroleum prices even uh, gone below uh, zero. That is negative price. So this thing happens. So this is not a, a, a Bible or tripita, uh, and the, that is not acceptable at all. But we must uh, we must uh, accept that Earth is going through a bad phase. Bad phase and sustainable rem development may be considered as a way out. And the other thing included in the webinar is public uh, partnership. How can we include the people who are the direct beneficiary? Actually, beneficiaries are hardly, uh, the planners hardly think about the beneficiaries. They think about themselves. They think about their technical uh, ability and all that, but least bothered about the beneficiaries who are the, uh, who are the worst were the, at the bottom of the society. So here comes the contradiction, here comes the conflict, here comes the uh, problem, uh, politics of sustainability, politics of development. Somebody in this webinar, our principal says that uh, developed world is taking, a, taking the lion's share of all this development. Actually, whatever development has happened in this world that was confined in the first world, in the last 30 years of after Second World War. But we started at a, at a very late period. We, uh, that is emerging economies like India, like China, they started late. And some other also uh, emerging countries like South Africa, Brazil, Mexico, they started late. So now, now we are imposing some restrictions on their development project on the pretext of environment and sustainability. So how, how can they uh, match these uh, first world countries? Emerging uh, economies are now facing uh, some problems due to this, this kind of uh, obstacles posed by the environmentalists and all that. Here comes the politics of environmental environmentalism. And as far as public uh, private partnership and participation of the uh, poor people in the development process. Here comes another problem. All kind of development, particularly in the emerging economies, uh, at the cost of the downtrodden. Development or the uh, big buildings or dams or, uh, or all kinds of development, including highways, national highways, all big projects, that, that causes the displacement of the uh, downtrodden people. So this is the de development of course, this is the development of the few elites, but at the cost of the poor people. So there comes the contradiction of uh, public private partnership and the pa participation of the people. Aravari model in our own West Bengal where the uh, villagers were given trees for the, for
for their own survival as well as the protection of environment this is a classical example of uh, participation of people people's participation without the when the peop uh, common people commoners uh, will be alienated there will be no development so this thing all these aspects will be discussed today's webinar i uh, i congratulate political science department to host this uh, webinar once again and i welcome all the panelists to uh, for their uh, valuable lecture thank you everybody thank you thank you so much sir uh, for sharing with us your valuable thoughts on sustainable development and also public participation which is definitely a need of the hour uh, not only for india uh, for any uh, country that has uh, democratic ideals uh, we would now like to begin with the technical sessions uh, before that uh, to all the listeners i would like to inform that you may please kindly post your comments and questions in the comment section box uh, along with the, uh, along with to whom it is addressed and also uh, with your own name and uh, we would like to take uh, questions for our uh, respectable speakers after each of their uh, talk is delivered so after each talk we would be addressing the questions posed let me now take the privilege to introduce to all of you dr professor shoris jha our first distinguished speaker dr shoris jha is affiliated to the department of political science rovindra bharati university kolkata he is currently working as associate professor and is the head of the department dr jha has authored and co-authored several national and international publications and also been working as a reviewer for reputed professional journals he is having an active association with different societies and academies around the world dr shoris jha made his mark in the scientific community with the contributions and wide recognition from honorable subject experts around the world his research interests include but are not limited to political ecology environmental movements theories of governance and practice apart from the academic responsibilities he is also serving as the founder chairman of activism foundation for social research and action which is engaged in research and dissemination of the social scientific knowledge for everyday life professor jha i welcome you to our webinar sir if you may please kindly uh, deliver your talk Uh, well, uh, am I audible? Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you, uh, Dr. Piyali Set, convener of this uh, international webinar, and thank you, Principal, the Vice Principal Sir, and IQA Coordinator of the Prabhu Chandra College. It's indeed a uh, great opportunity and privilege before me uh, to talk about uh, this kind of international webinar, you know, entitled as Environmentalism, Issues of Sustainability and Public Participation. It's a kind of uh, webinar, I think, uh, with a different flavor. Uh, yes, I'm saying it's different flavor because, you know, uh, during this time of corona crisis, the whole academy all over the world, they are primarily engaged in discussion directly with the issues related to COVID-19. And in this context, Kolkata is no exception to that trend, but uh, the Prabhupada Chandra College, they organized a kind of seminar which focusing upon the issues of environment and environmentalism. So thank you again to all of you, all of the organizers. And thank you to other uh, uh, experts of this panel. And of course, I would like to extend my thanks to the audience. Well, uh, without taking much time in introduction, I will just enter into my topic of discussion. But as I was informed that uh, 
a major part of the audience uh, they are the students of this college and uh, it could have been uh, better to talk in a mixed mode method like uh, using uh, both english and vernacular simultaneously but i think uh, it would be a, a quite problematic so what i have decided is that to speak uh, on at first in english when i am deliver my presentation and in the question hour session i'll speak in bengali and the question hour session of bangla book well uh, you know i'm uh, going to talk on uh, the post colonial environmentalism in bengal lessons from doers yes uh, it is uh, quite uh, you know uh, less known or unknown history of bengal what i <coughs> might to explore or what i want to explore before you it is a less known history you know political history of environmentalism yes when i am talking about post colonial i would like to uh mean the time frame that is the post independence period when i am talking about you know the environmentalism i would like to mean the ideology and movement which is concerning about environment not only environmental protection but there are issues too that is related to environment and when i am talking about doers you know i am referring to the northern part of west bengal that includes you know the jalpi kojbihar and newly formed alipurduar district well uh, this uh, work actually uh, it was uh, actually uh, it was been it has been done uh, before some time two or three years back i have completed this work finally and it was actually 10 or 10 years experience to dig or to uncover what happened in bengal or what is the contribution of bengal so as the indian environmentalism is concerned so before going into the topic i would like to mention certain common beliefs and myths about indian environmentalism first you know when uh, we are talking about the post colonial indian indian environmentalism certain big names captures the mind like chipko Narmada Bachao, Silent Valley, Apico, Ims, and you could not find any place, or you could not find any reference of Bengal so far as the post-colonial environmentalism or environmental movement is concerned. Is it true? This is my question. And the book I am talk about it will show you that no because. you know it is a bit surprising or it surprises to me because you know bengal is a place for vibrant is a vibrant place for social movements even before the independence you know and even after independence there are so many movements social movements they were taking place and i was quite astonished some 10 years back that why there is no rifts of environmental movement in bengal so it's quite surprising and i think it is a matter of thinking but it's a matter of fact now that yes there is a place great place of bengal so far as the indian environmentalism after the post independence period is, con is concerned the second belief or myth that post colonial environmentalism in india begins with the chipko movement yes it is also a myth right now factually it was started actually the post colonial first environmental movement so far has been recorded it was started in north bengal northern part of bengal in the doers region and third that is the post colonial environmentalism in india it is characterized by the paradigm of environmentalism of the poor you know it was a thesis actually that was put forwarded in 1993 by the great environmentalist ramachandra guho 
along with environmental economist John Martinez Allier. And later on, Allier developed it into a theory. <clears throat> and following this theory, what it refers actually, the struggle of the communities against partial or total disposition from their resource base. And uh, it was actually from uh, ecological distribution conflict. That is the issue of access to the natural but, uh, I would like to show you that it cannot be the exhaustive paradigm to understand the Indian environmentalism as a whole. There are other sides of the coin too. So I termed this historic movement as the doers movement because you know it was taken place in the doers region of Bengal that was stretches from Tista River on the west to Sonkos River in the east. And it was the gateway to Bhutan and northeastern state. And the movement actually that happened for a long period, that is almost for a decade, that was started in 67. Now the movement was culminated in 76. That is almost 10 years, the long movement. So throughout the period, there was a continuity. But I have divided the movement into three episodic phases, depending upon the issues, achievement, and momentum. The first phase was in between 67 to 68. The next phase was between 69 to 71. And the last phase between 70 to 76. You know, when uh, the movement, it was just, uh, uh, it is the ending phase. That time, that is in 73, Chipko movement began. When this movement I'm talking about is going to mark its end. Well, it is an interesting thing too. Well, it was not occurred or not emanated from the ecological distribution conflict in terms of uh, the right to access resources. But it principally fought against the colonial legacy of ecological exploitation of the forest and its people. Yes, colonial legacy is important because the background of the movement, it was prepared with the British intervention into the forest of Doers in 1866. You know, after <coughs> some time in 1874, uh, first time British uh, created the reserve forest in North Bengal while dividing the whole region into two forest division. One is Jalpaiguri and another was in Boxa. And during that period, you know, actually British Emperor was from financial crunch due to Sipai mutiny. There are other issues too. So the principal task before the first conservancy was the first revenue generation, and the second was extraction of timber and principal spaces uh, for various uh, the preparing of tea boxes that is for adjacent tea gardens in Doers region, office paneling in Great Britain and India too, and of course for the uh, British Royal Navy. These were actually uh, uh, main uh, source of demand for Doers woods. And so the objective was the revenue generation and for the British forester, it was imperative that the protection of Sal forest, because that was the principal spaces during that time in Doers. Till that it is also principal spaces, but there are other spaces too, like tick that was planted later on. Well, that time the Sal that takes the priority, the principal spaces. But the threat before the Sal forest, where the where the British forest are identified that time, was two, were two actually. One is fire and another one is grazing. And the source of both two actually threats were none other than the indigenous community where the British has identified 
like Rava, Mech, Garo, etc. They were the sifting cultivators that time, you know, who practiced a typical form of agriculture that is known as sifting cultivation by clearing <clears throat> land of cultivation in forest patches by rotation, where the use of fire was considered as a key component for preparing the land for plantation and agriculture. So this uh, sifting cultivate, cultivation that may be a cause of forest fire, according to the British, and of course the grazing, livestock grazing, the livestock uh, of the, you know, the indigenous communities. So the British forester, they decided to chew them out of the jungle. And they did it either by force or by providing certain meager compensation, you know, like uh, rupees five per acre cultivable land or rupees two per per house sifted. But after certain years, two or three years or four years, they found the result, it was negative. It did not give rise the production of salt. Rather, the production of salt, it was going to diminish. It was decreasing down. It was become a problematic. The question is why? An investigation team, it was set up by the forest conservator. And that team find out that it has happened because due to absence of biotic influences like fire, grazing, you know, a timendrous undergrowth of semi-evergreen species, which crowded old salt trees and severely impeded the growth of new salt ceilings. Because, you know, <clears throat> in terms of climatic zone, it's high elephant zone. And in the absence of biotic disturbance, Say disturbances like fire and grazing, this semi evergreen species like savanna and so many other species, small species, they crowded, they grown up and impede the growth of salt trees. And now, what was the solution? The British foresters, like you know, Sabir, Grieve, and Hart, came with the solution in favor of introduction of fire for clearing the land after clear flooding cope of the old forest tracts and simultaneously cultivation of land between rows of the plantation. And this method in its crude form was known as Tongya. It is actually the Burmese word. Tong means hill and, and Ya means cultivation. And this method of Tongya it was converted into a mode of artificial regeneration of forest and that was first experimented in the Burmese highland by Dr. Detris Bandris, the first inspector general of forest in India. And British foresters, they recommended for borrowing thought from Burmese highland to the doer's forest. And so, the Tongya first time in India, it was introduced in 1883 in North Bengal and after then 1886 in Silate in Assam and 1890 in Kurg in Karnataka. Well, uh, the Tongya here in the tours, it does not only become or did not only become merely a system of uh, for its product uh, generation, but it becomes a system of management of resource production. You know why I'm saying this? Because for incorporation of this system into the management of scientific forestry, the future they need it the indigenous people because at that period, at that time, only the indigenous community, they know 
the technique of slash and burn. So for that, for that reason, they established a kind of peculiar kind of settlement in North Bengal and the Doers region, namely the forest villages. The forest village, my dear friends, it does not mean a village residing in forest. I could not find any forest villages in Sundarbon. I could not find any forest villages in Jungle Mall or any forest tract in Bengal. It can be found or could be found only in the Doers region or in North Bengal. You see. And what was happened in that forest villages, in those forest villages, the villagers they were offered, you know, free houses for staying there and free drinking there. And along with this, a cultivable land, part family, five acres of cultivable land. And, you know, there are certain other privileges like free firewood, free fodder, etc. But at the same time, the residents of forest villages, they must have to do all the plantation work, the free of wages for 90 days. And for this, they introduced a bond or annual agreement with the indigenous community. And that was used to renew in each and every year, who were actually the resident of those forest villages. You know. So the forest village, it was established that time, and the agreement was taken place. The indigenous community, they returned back to the doer's forest again, and they used their method of slash and burn for preparing the forest land. And they used to cultivate, or they were uh, actually entitled, they were given the right to cultivate the land between plantation or between plantation under this annual agreement. So, you know, a drastic changes that was taken place in Doers Forest that time. And it was a big success, big success. If you, uh, if somebody of you know about the research on the Tonga system, you will find that there are so many reflections on that during this period, like uh, the success of Tongya. You know, one of the great anthropologists, Carlson, B.G. Carlson, was professor in the London University, and now perhaps he is in Canada right now, who termed this as the revolution in the environmental history of doers. It was the success of Tongya. Another herpetologist, Sibram Krishnan from Yale University, United States, who termed it, it is the first time the recognition of local forestry knowledge within the framework of scientific forestry. And for me, it was the first participatory model of natural resource governance in India, where both the local people and their knowledge was incorporated. However, this is barely the one side, the success of Tongya. There are other side too. And that was a bad side. That was a side who talked about exploitation because, you know, it was nothing but exploitation under the disguise of cooperation. You see, because no customary rights of the forest people were granted, no customary rights. Even they did not choose, they could not choose the field crops they want to cultivate. They could not choose the forest spaces for plantation. And apart from that, you know, <coughs> they had to sign that agreement compulsory in each and every year and saying that will on demand any wages for forestry works, whatever it is, plantation, clearing, wedding, 
say forest from animals and fire and so on. And all family members, including the children and women, they were bound to do forestry work under this agreement without any remuneration. And if anyone refused, they have been tortured by the British foresters. And more importantly, they had to sift the forest villages or location after every plantation cycle. So no one is the permanent resident of any forest village. No forest villages. That was the situation. And this exploitation, it will be surprising to know that it was continuing or continued even after independence. And not only continue, you know, it becomes severe after independence due to inept and corrupt bureaucracies and landlord attitude of the forest department. After the independence, what happened? The villagers were deprived of their bond entitlements, which were under the agreement. They used to sign the agreement till 1967. Mind it, after 20 years of independence, until and unless the movement dismantled the system. But they had to sign the agreement, but you know, they were not getting the bona fide entitlement where they were used to get during the British period, like free firewood, <clears throat> fodder, <clears throat> and right to grazing, you know. And what happened additionally, agricultural land for cultivation that was fragmented because of the increase in population. And there was no agreement by the forest department with the second generation forest villagers. No agreement. As a result, they did not have the right to cultivate. They don't have the land, and, don't have, and they did not have the right to stay in a house offered by the forest department in forest villages. It was a situation, and it was going on. And all these led to the increasing grievances. But those who are not crystallized into a struggle until the peasant and workers movement in Bengal took a decisive turn during the late 60s in the region. Yes, there are so many influences upon this movement. And the first, the foremost among them will be, uh, I think, uh, uh, will find interest by hearing the name, listening the name. That is none other than the great leader of national struggle, Subhash Chandra Bose, the great leader. He has formative influence upon the movement because the radicalism movement was greatly indebted to the ideals and techniques of Subhash Chandra Bose. If, if you look back, you will find that in 39, Subhash Chandra Bose visited Jalpaiguri as the president of All India Congress Committee to attend Bengal Provincial Congress. And his visit to Jalpaiguri inspired a group of young people for the liberation movement. And among them, there was Nirmal Chandra Bose, who did not play an important role merely in freedom movement. When aftermath of independence, was active as a forward block leader to spread the spirit of liberation among the peasants and workers in the district. <clears throat> and Nirmal Bose, when he met with the pioneering leader of the doers movement, I'm going to talk about Ram Sra, they planned together to execute Netaji's unrealized plan of action of liberation of peasants and workers and make them or set them free from all form of slavery in the tea gardens and forest of North Bengal. And following the plan of action, the movement demanded the end of exploitation and slavery, which was embedded in the Tongya system. And the movement also incorporated the Netaji's ideal of village punch 
to govern local community by <coughs> the villagers and representative of the villagers and it was incorporated in their 17 point charter of demands later on and also the movement took resort of the technique of active resistance from netaji subhash chandra bose in gandhian passive resistance and when you know the leader the great leader movement ramesh rai visited the villages the villagers often called him the true disciple of the great subhash chandra bose and the bearer of the torch of subhash chandra bose and his spirit of liberation in the forest patches in the forest domain but you know apart from uh, the influences of ideas and ethics of subhash chandra bose there are other influences too like you know workers and peasant movements in bengal that time in general which was started during the eve of independence like it includes uh, like tebaga movement berubari movement even the naxalbari movement in the tarai region but the single most influence can be credited to the tea workers movement in doors that that was started in 1950s 1950s on the issue of you know on the issues like low wages heavy workload and the bonus movement particularly it had tremendous impact upon the forest workers and forest villagers to mobilize a movement in the forest but the final ground it was prepared with the formation of you know the first united front government in west bengal with their 18 points program which recognize the legitimate rights to form unions by employees of all categories including workers and peasants you know and further the pro labor policy by the then labor minister subodh banerji and his legitimizing hero technique of it also inspired the movement because the movement extensively used this technique of hero throughout the course of struggle now the movement began i'm talking about the first phase that is the initial phase shaping resistance in between 67 and 68 the ramesh rai who was actually the ration dealer at hasimara and as well he used to chat and talk with the for his villagers and listen there about their sufferings pains and so on and that moved him to talk the movement the moved that moved him to organize a movement in order to achieve their bona fide rights to live or to stay in free in the independence india independent india you know ramesh rai who was actually got support from some of the district leadership of proud block like nirmal chandra bose i said binoy bhomik satyajit sen and in october 67 ramesh rai and his followers they started their first campaign at kodal bosti forest village on the issues of tongya but nothing happened there but soon after that in the godam dabri forest village the forest department took the initiative of eviction of 29 forest villagers they were actually second generation settlers and under the leadership promise of ramesh rai hundreds of villagers they mobilized and gathered out the beat office at godam dabri and as a result of that police came and ramesh rai was caught by the police force and sent to the jail you know but the movement never stopped the resistance did not stop there and forest department finally failed to evict those 29 forest villagers it was the first and success of the struggle and the second in 1968 the then governor of west bengal dharmavira they came to 
Hasimara, you know, the air base of Indian Army, and thousands of forest villagers mobilized there under the leadership of Promise Rai. And they get out Dharmavira and placed a deposition where the first demand was the abolition of Tongya system in the forest, in the Dwarves forest. And after that, sparing with this kind of mobilization, the first time created an organization of movement that was known as North Bengal Forest Workers and Jagri Cultivators Union. It was registered union by the Society Registration Act in West Bengal. And after the formation of the union, the movement that spread across the region and resistance started beat-wise and range-wise. And as a result of that, in this year, or in that year, the forest department largely failed to renew the annual agreement. But it does not or it did not succeed to dismantle the Tongya system as a whole. And it was happened or it happened during the second phase of movement I'm going to talk about that happened between 69 to 71. You know, in 1969, the second United Front government came to the power in West Bengal with its 32 points program. And in this 32 point program, the United Front, uh, United Front government, they for the first time declared that government of West Bengal will pay due attention, you know, to the preservation of forest and its people who demands on the forest for their livelihood. I think this is first kind of governmental declaration that was made by any state of India during that period of time. And this government encouraged the villagers, encouraged to spread the movement across divisions. A new group of volunteers were emerged and women and youth brigade were formed to shield against the police and every personal atrocities. A continuous education program that were undertaken across the range and divisions and that almost paralyzed the routine work department during that period. And at this time, they prepared North Bengal First Workers and Jaya Cultivators Union, but I mean to say 17 points charter of demands. And the first demand was again, the abolition of Tongya system and the slavery and introduction of wages, rupees three per day for forest to work. And it was the first priority, first demand. And the leaders went to Calcutta and placed their demand, charter of demands, before the then Forest Minister Bhavatu Soren. And following, he called a tripartite meeting with the leaders of the movement, forest department, and the labor department. And it was happened in uh, 15th October 69. And resolution was passed for introduction of ways for the forest villagers with 2.5 per day. It was in a sense historic achievement because introduction of ways, it marked the discontinuation of Tongya system. However, the actual situation on ground that in Orson each passing day, because on the ground, the forest rangers, beat office and DFOs, they were refused to pay any wages to the forest villagers even after months, the resolution was taken, was taken. And you know, the forest villages, they were annoyed. And the grievances, they were accumulated. And the leaders of the movement, they sat together and finally decided an independent strike of forestry walks through all doors. And you might be wondered to hear that indefinite strike in the forest that was continued till 18 months, that is one year and a half months, in order to abolish the Tongya system and interaction of wages. And perhaps it is the longest strike 
in the history of forest movement in India. Longest strike, 18 months indefinite strike in the jungle. But I mean, this strike in 70, what happened? You know, the union started putting pressure upon the DFOs for regularization of the forest land for the second generation settlers. But they did not hear. And as a reaction, they started eviction. And what happened worst in this situation? It was in the Gosaihat Forest Villages in 1971, when the strike was. The forest department started employing outside contractor and laborers for forestry. The strike was going on, and no forest villages were agreed to do the forestry walks. And when in the Gosaihat Forest Village, it was taking place. The union leaders and the forest villagers went there and forcefully thrown out the forest contractors and outside laborers. And the forest up by the villagers. The education took a violent form. Because why we are, you are actually incorporating labor from outside. No works will happen. Domain of forest, until unless Tonga system was dismantled. <clears throat> but you know, the affair were lost against the leaders, and it was on 11 June 1971 at midnight. The forest officials came with, along with the police from Dhubguri police stations, to arrest the leaders at Gosayat for his village. However, the villagers installed the barricade to save their villages, but the police could not stop and started firing on the mob at midnight. And what happened? Several people were injured with the bullets, and five villagers died on the spot, namely Ajman Rava Jetharai, Mongrao Rao, Sadhu Rao, and Chandu Rao. And besides that, the police arrested a number of villagers and leaders and took to the police station. And you know, it was, I think, the first martyrdom in the post-colonial environmental movement in India. And this martyrdom of five villagers created a tremendous impact on the overall political atmosphere. And villagers from all the divisions became united and came to the street. And the violent demonstration that was taking place throughout the region, maybe in the village, maybe in the township. And finally, with the intervention of the then Deputy Chief Minister of West Bengal, Bijay Singh Nahar, you know, the turbulence came under control. He immediately declared the introduction of rupees three per day that was the demand of the UN and regulation of the first land in the name of residing villagers. And with this, finally, the movement achieved the great success and Tongya system was discontinued in the region. However, the movement could not or did not stop altogether with this achievement of Tongya. In 1972, on the same day of the matter dumb, that is 10th June, the union, they are a two days conference of the forest villagers. And this conference, 10 and 11 June actually, and this two days conference, they decided to move against the issues of deforestations because it is directly related to the protection and preservation of forest and survival of the forest people. And they found or they identified the main threats before the large scale deforestation in the doer's forest were none other than but the nexus, but the dishonest forest official and the contractor. 
and the illicit logging of thousand and thousand cubic meters of woods from the doer's forest. There is a huge corruption and deforestation. And so, on the basis of the decision, they formed a village party, quote unquote, in each and every villages for patrolling. That period in 1972, for patrolling and find out the culprits. And what happened, you know, they caught red handed so many first officials, so many, not single. Not one, two, three. There are so many in different places, along with the contractors. They actually playing played a huge role. Please logging. They caught red-handed and hand over to the police. You know, as a section of the department became annoyed with this action of the forest villages, and so. They again started the process of eviction, the instrument of coercion. So, you know, happened again the agitation that was started. But during this period in 1975, the national emergency it was declared, and the forest. Department got the support from Central Reserve Police Force with them, and they forcibly evict, evicted one of the village, namely Balabusti, beside the Sankos River. You know, the villagers got mobilized and registered the sports, but they did not much headway. And so in 1976, immediately during an emergency, they moved to the Kolkata, Kolkata High Court. And the High Court, they released an interim order, stay order, on this eviction process. And finally in 79, with the final verdict of the court, the court declared that uh, eviction is illegitimate. And so the finally the eviction process was stopped altogether. However, with this, the movement coming to its close ends because due national emergency, a number of leaders were arrested and sent to the jails. And that weakened the movement. Now, well, I'm just going to finish. I'm talking about some of the significance. You know, I must say that till date, it is the first ever recorded environmental movement in the post colonial India. It was happened or taken place before Chipko. It was the first ever recorded environmental movement. Second, it represents the alternative paradigm of Indian environmentalism, both its content and forms. In form board, broadly, it finishes, falls, uh, not finishes, falls within, you know, the left radical tradition of environmentalism, since it assumes a positive and proactive role of the state and sustainable harsa, harsa, harnessing and governance of local resources and greater access and control over resources by the ecosystem people. That was the demand. And however, it differs with the conventional Marxist position of internationalism and inspired heavily national interest and nationalist ideals of Netaji. It adheres to the national interest while fighting against ecological exploitation. And during the case, you know, Kolkata High Court, the union stated its position, the quote unquote, that it endorses the policy of effective implementation of afforestation in North Bengal to support an animals in national interest. The movement was organized not against any specific class enemy, but the focus was essentially against the Tongiasism of access in the domain of natural resource governance and the corrupt extracts from the and the movement 
explicitly or implicitly believe on the holistic view of organic inter interdependence between the ecosystem and the people our protection of forest implies the protection of its people and the movement posed also a challenge to the one side and understanding of indian environmentalism it showed that grassroots environmentalism in india does not always arise out arise out of conflict to get access and control over natural resources unlike in moment support it often emanated from the ecologically exploitative practices of natural resource governance and lastly i'll say the movement inspires a range of resistance in the region till late like orange orchard resistance in 1993 and introduction of panchayat in 1998 can you believe you know where in west bengal the panchayat system it was introduced in 78 79 during this period but in forest the panchayat system it was introduced in 1998 after two decades and it was happened after the movement that was taken place by the forest villagers and tigatin workers and lastly the movement inspired the forest right movement which was started in the region in 2000 under the banner of national forum of forest forest people and forest workers which along with other pan indian forest organization organized the pan indian movement you know and due to that the introduction of forest right act that was happened that was taken place forest right act 2006 and that was started implementing in 2010 2010 in india and with this implementation of forest right act which was started in 2010 and almost culminated in 2015 the forest village system the british peculiar british construct at the for the first time it was gone abolished and converted into the revenue villages and it was happened in 2015 can you imagine and with this i am just i am just thanking you all for keeping patience and listening this epic movement of doers who has had a great contribution towards indian environmentalism both in terms of its content and in terms of origination thank you very much thank you dr jha it was indeed very enlightening and intriguing to listen to you a uh, very candid and interesting talk may i now request professor shuparna ganguly to please kindly start with the question and answer session and hence also communicate the questions posed by our listeners to us uh, to our distinguished speakers uh, thank you priyali uh, thank you sir for uh, such an illuminating deliberation it was indeed very informative and engaging now we have received uh, quite a number of questions for you uh, i would I'll just present them one by one it's from prodipta kumar panda uh, he is asking uh, how environmental ethics is related to green governance uh, as the themes of green governance needs public awareness and people's participation he also has another question so do i uh, take them together club them and uh, would you like to answer them to, uh, together or and put them one by one sir actually the first question uh, that was posed before me what you said is that it is actually yes. beyond uh, beyond my discussion it is a separate issue i say uh, the problem of ethics in governance okay it is a all, altogether different issue uh, we are talking right. about first i will address the questions 
that is actually coming out from my presentation out of my presentation okay and if okay. time permits then so, i will go then we'll to other questions this. okay uh, so it's uh, from uh, nobonita de uh, she is asking like do you think some long term changes of people behavior do you think some uh, Oh, do you think some long term changes uh, of people behavior uh, for sustainable good environment okay you uh, tell me all the questions i will answer together okay, okay. so it, it it's from uh, pile shaha the next one oh. that can public participation be effective in ensuring environmental sustainability Uh, can it be used to control natural disasters and from shonjay bishash it is uh, he seeks your opinion on the level of awareness uh, in west bengal regarding environmental issues and the last one is there from dr shoman chakraborty he is asking can forest governance be the uh, alternative system in globalized local so for the timing we have received well, these questions nice so can just elaborate on this oh, okay uh, fine thank you for questioning uh, could i speak in bengali what could have been better dear students yeah. i'm asking what i said before aje banglay bolbo tale chhatro der shunte hobe ha banglay banglay bolte hobe लोकल এটা নিয়ে একটু অবকাশ রয়েছে মানে প্রশ্নের অবকাশ রয়েছে কারণ বিষয়টা হচ্ছে যে ফরেস্ট হচ্ছে একটা সেক্টর এনভায়রনমেন্টের দেন আর সো মেনি সেক্টরস ইউ নো ফরেস্ট এয়ার ওয়াটার অনেকগুলো সেক্টর রয়েছে তো ফরেস্ট একটা মাত্র সেক্টর যদিও এটা ঠিক যে এটা হচ্ছে সে অর্থে প্রিন্সিপাল সেক্টর বলা হয় এনভায়রনমেন্ট रिलेटेड যতগুলো সেক্টর রয়েছে একটা অর্থে বিকজ ইউ নো the deforestation er phole je greenhouse gas ebong tar je global impact amra dekhte pacchi tar phole prothom etake rod kora ebong rokkha kora jeta ekhono obdi kintu gota bishwer kache challenge deforestation shesh hoye jay ekhono cholche bibhinno jagay apnara jodi taken bhetore jodi jete paren giye dekhben bhetor ta phaka ar ekta khub sundor amra dekhte pai er ki eigulo cholche bibhinno form e to ডেফিনেটলি ফরেস্ট গভর্নেন্স এর একটা রোল তো আছে কিন্তু প্রশ্নটা কিন্তু ফরেস্ট গভর্নেন্স কোনো কিছুর বিকল্প কি না তার থেকেও বড় প্রশ্ন হচ্ছে যে আমরা অল্টারনেটিভ ফরেস্ট গভর্নেন্সটাকে কিভাবে তৈরি করতে পারি হাউ ক্যান উই বিল্ড আপ দ্য অল্টারনেটিভ ফর্ম অফ ফরেস্ট গভর্নেন্স হুইচ ইজ অ্যাকচুয়ালি এখন চলছে যে ফর্মে ফরেস্ট গভর্নেন্স চলছে বিশেষ করে আপনি ভারতবর্ষের দিকে যদি তাকান তাহলে দেখতে পাবেন যে এখনো অব দি ফরেস্ট ব্যুরোক্র্যাসি দে আর ওভারভেলভিং কন্ট্রোল অফ দ্য ফরেস্ট ব্যুরোক্র্যাটস এই যে পার্টিসিপেশন ধরুন আপনারা হয়তো জানেন যারা ফরেস্ট নিয়ে একটু পড়াশোনা করেছেন যে এই 90 থেকে শুরু হয়ে এই ফরেস্ট প্রোটেকশন ইকো ডেভেলপমেন্ট কমিটি জয়েন্ট ফরেস্ট ম্যানেজমেন্ট কমিটি এই সমস্ত তৈরি হয়েছে সমস্ত ফরেস্টে গোটা ভারতবর্ষে ওয়েস্ট বেঙ্গল ব্যতিক্রম নয় সমস্ত জায়গাতেই রয়েছে জয়েন্ট ফরেস্ট কমিটি যার মূল এটা হচ্ছে কি যে যারা লোকাল পিপল পিপল তাদেরকে নিয়ে একসাথে গভর্ন করা এটা হচ্ছে আসল কিন্তু বাস্তব হচ্ছে কি দেয়ার আর সো মেনি রিসার্চেস যা দেখা গেছে যে আসলে কোঅপারেশনের বদলে কোঅপশন হচ্ছে তারা ওদেরকে কাজে লাগাচ্ছে তাদের নিজেদের এজেন্ডাকে পারপিচুয়েট করার জন্য আসলে কিন্তু যে অবজেক্টিভ এই সমস্ত পার্টিসিপেটরি মেক তৈরি হয়েছে ফর সাস্টেনেবিলিটি সেটা এক বলবো না 
কিন্তু দ্যাট ইজ লিটল ওয়ার্কিং লিটল ওয়ার্কিং কারণ ফরেস্টাররা তাদের কি করে তাদের ফরেস্ট প্রোটেকশনের হিসাব দেয় শুধু ক্যানোপি কভার দিয়ে ক্যানোপি কভার দ্যাট ইজ স্যাটেলাইট ইমেজেস বাট হোয়াট ওয়াজ হ্যাপেনিং ইন দ্য রিয়েল গ্রাউন্ড আপনারা যদি যান দেখতে পাবেন যে এই যে স্পেসিস ফরেস্ট সেটা অনেক জায়গাতেই ধ্বংস যেটা কেন টু কেন টু কভার দিয়ে সবটা বোঝা যায় না বোঝা যায় না এবং শুধু তাই নয় আপনি যদি যান দেখবেন যে বিভিন্ন জায়গায় হোল তৈরি হয়ে গিয়েছে যেখানে ফরেস্ট প্যাচেস আগে ছিল কিন্তু এখন তার কোনো এক্সিস্টেন্স নেই ওল ফরেস্ট ট্র্যাক স্ট্রিপ টপ ট্রিস এটা আমি অন্তত পক্ষে ওয়েস্ট বেঙ্গলের রেফারেন্সে ভারতবর্ষের আজও বিভিন্ন জায়গায় রয়েছে কিন্তু প্র্যাকটিক্যালি জঙ্গল মহলে দেখতে পাবেন সুন্দরবনে দেখতে পাবেন নর্থ বেঙ্গলে দেখতে পাবেন তো ফলে যে সাস্টেনেবিলিটি জন্য যেটা যেটা মূল উদ্দেশ্য মেন অবজেকটিভ ফর ফরেস্ট গভর্নেন্স সেই গভর্নেন্সটাকে যদি ক্যারি ফরওয়ার্ড করতে হয় প্রথম যেটা দরকার সেটা কি খুব আনফর্চুনেটলি যেটা আমরা দেখতে পাই যে এই রাইটটা ভারতবর্ষে ইনাক্টেড হলেও সেটা কিন্তু তার কিন্তু ফুল বেনিফিট ভারতবর্ষের কোন প্রান্তের ফরেস্ট ভিলেজাররা পায়নি আজকে আমি যখন এ ওয়েবিনার করছি বাকি সাথে আমার আরেকটা ওয়েবিনারে আমার ইনভিটেশন ছিল যেটা আমি ডিনাই করেছি সেটা ওই ন্যাশনাল ফোরাম অফ ফরেস্ট পিপুল ফরেস্ট ওয়ার্কার্স তারা অল ওভার দ্য ওয়ার্ল্ড করছে মুম্বাইয়ে এই ইস্যু নিয়ে যে ফরেস্ট ভিলেজার্সরা অল ওভার দ্য ইন্ডিয়া দে ডিড নট গেট দ্য বেনিফিট অফ ফর রাইট অ্যাক্ট তাদের ইন্ডিভিজুয়াল রাইটস অনেক ক্ষেত্রে তারা পায় কিছু জায়গা হয়েছে যেমন তাদের কি পাটটা দিয়েছে জমির যেটা ছিল না ওই যে আমি একটু আগে বললাম ফরেস্ট ভিলেজ গুলোকে রেভিনিউ ভিলেজ করা হয়েছে পাটটা দিয়েছে জমির কিন্তু সেই পাটটার দাগ নম্বর নেই ক্ষতিয়ার নম্বর নেই ব্যাংকে গেলেই ফেলে দিচ্ছে তারা লোন পাচ্ছে না এগ্রিকালচারের জন্য কিন্তু ফরেস্ট রাইট অ্যাক্টের মধ্যে আরো যেটা ইম্পর্টেন্ট কজ ছিল কি ফরেস্ট প্রোটেকশন ভিলেজরা করবে তারা কমিউনিটি প্রোটেকশন করবে ফরেস্ট কম্পার্টমেন্ট গুলো তাদের জন্ম দিতে পারি এবং এর সঙ্গে আমার মনে হয় পলিটিক্যাল পার্টিসিপেশন এবং রাজনৈতিক মানে এই যে রাজনৈতিক অংশগ্রহণের প্রশ্নগুলো যুক্ত কারণ পলিটিক্স ইজ এভরিওয়ের তো যখন পার্টিসিপেশনের কথা আমরা বলবো সেই পার্টিসিপেশন শুধুমাত্র যেন ইন টার্মস অফ মানে ভোটিং রাইটস না হয় অ্যাক্টিভ পার্টিসিপেশন হয় এবং অবশ্যই রাজনৈতিক দলগুলো তারা কিন্তু যদি দেখেন আপনি এই ফরেস্ট প্রোটেকশনের ক্ষেত্রে লোকালি বিভিন্ন রাজনৈতিক দল কিছু কিছু কাজ করে কিন্তু ইন জেনারেল আপনি দেখাতে পারবেন না যে রাজনৈতিক দলগুলো কি বলবো পলিটিক্যাল অ্যাকচুয়ালি ফরেস্ট রাইট অ্যাক্ট নিয়ে যে প্রবলেমটা ভিলেজার্সরা ফেস করছে রাইটস পাচ্ছে না একটা কনস্টিটিউশনাল রাইট সে সাংঘাতিক ডেমোস্ট্রেশন করেছে খুব সাংঘাতিকভাবে আর কি হ্যাঁ টুকটাক আপনি ডেমোস্ট্রেশন দেখতে পাবেন কিন্তু সাংঘাতিক একটা স্ট্রাগল করেছে সেটা কিন্তু আপনি দেখতে পাবেন না তো এটাই আমার বলার আপাতত আমি কিছু বাদ দিয়ে থাকি আবার প্রশ্ন করুন আমি নিশ্চয়ই আলোচনা করব থ্যাংক ইউ স্যার আমরা আর একটা প্রশ্ন পেয়েছি দীপঙ্কর কর্মকার ইজ আস্কিং হোয়াট শুড হোয়াট স্টেপ শুড বি টেকেন বাই দ্য গভর্নমেন্ট টু ম্যানেজ এনভায়রনমেন্টাল হ্যাজার্ডস বাই টেকিং ইন টু কনসিডারেশন দ্য সাস্টেনেবল ডেভেলপমেন্ট গোলস এটা আবার আউট অফ দ্য ট্র্যাক কোশ্চেন এনিওয়ে ঘটনা হচ্ছে যে এনভায়রনমেন্টাল হ্যাজার্ডস এর জন্য এনভায়রমেন্টাল হ্যাজার্ডস এটার জন্য কতগুলো প্রোটোকল অলরেডি তৈরি হয়েছে ইন্টারন্যাশনালি এবং সেগুলোকে কিভাবে মোকাবিলা করা যাবে হ্যাঁ তো ফলে সাস্টেনেবল ডেভেলপমেন্ট গোলস যেগুলো রয়েছে সেগুলোকে অ্যাচিভ করার জন্য যেটা প্রেসক্রাইব যেটা তোমার ধরে নাও ইউনাইটেড নেশন যেটা প্রেসক্রাইব করেছে ইউএনডিপি যেটা প্রেসক্রাইব করেছে সেই প্রোটোকল গুলো যদি মেনটেন করা হয় ঠিক মতো তাহলে এনভায়রনমেন্টাল হ্যাজার্স ম্যানেজ করা যাবে 
So I am not talking about the environmental hazards right now, and I am not expertise upon that or on that direction. I have to learn about all these things of environmental hazards and how they should can be managed. One thing that is important, I think, that is you know the waste management, and that must be focused upon. So far as the environmental hazards are concerned, waste management is one might be one of the important sector so far as the environmental hazards management is concerned and waste management er khetre amra dekhi solid waste management er khetre joto ta gurutto dewa hoy kintu onnano je waste gulo royeche medical waste gulo onnano amra jani je waste gulo shekhaneo kintu gurutto khub sanghatik bhabe je dewa hoy ta kintu noy thik ache jodio eta kokhonoi bola jabe na je solid waste management khub sob jagai khub successful ha kono kono jagay amader rajye besh koto gulo jagay kintu successful hoyeche আমি রিকোয়েস্ট করব পার্টিসিপেন্টদের আমি আউট অফ দা বক্স বলছি না হোয়াট আই হ্যাভ স্পোক আপন আমি যে বিষয়টা নিয়ে বললাম দয়া করে কারণ এটা এনভায়রমেন্টাল ক্লাস নয় আমি বুঝতে পারছি বেশ কিছু আমারও ছাত্র রয়েছে এটার মধ্যে কিন্তু এটা আমি এনভায়রমেন্টালিজমের উপর ক্লাস নিচ্ছি না সরি মানে পলিটিক্যাল ইকোলজির উপর ক্লাস নিচ্ছি এখানে আই এম জাস্ট টকিং অ্যাবাউট সার্টেন স্পেসিফিক থিং give reflection upon the book the historic movement questioning upon the movement and i would encourage to do that tumra shudhu chief movement jene boshe acho kintu eto boro ekta movement jeta west bengal e hoyeche and we feel proud of that say movement somporke amra jani na reference nei to ami bolbo tomader ke ami onurodh korbo ba apnader ke sokolke je setar por proshno korun tahole answer gulo হয়তো ঠিকঠাক এবং যুক্তিসঙ্গত ভাবে দেওয়া যাবে You are not audible, Mashkar. Mashkar, we can't hear you. Can you please check your settings? Am I audible now? Yes. yes. Hello. Thank you. Yes, yes. Good evening, everyone. Hope you all are doing well in these unprecedented times. Coming back to our technical round, I would like to introduce our next eminent speaker, Dr. Orijit Kumar Das. He is a molecular biologist in the Department of Veterinary Medicine, Cambridge University. During his early years of education in Kolkata, he had completed his bachelor's degree in zoology from the University of Calcutta. Subsequently, he obtained his master's degree in biotechnology from Bangalore University. Dr. Das was then awarded the National Scholarship by CSIR NET and went on to complete his PhD in Transcriptional Biology at the Institute of Microbial Technology, Chandigarh. He studied human pathogen mycobacterium tuberculosis during his PhD and has published several research works in international eminent journals. He was also awarded the Ranbaxy Prize for the Best Science Scholar in 2012. After completing his PhD, Dr. Das joined University of Cambridge for his postdoctoral studies. Presently, he works as a senior research scientist at the University of Cambridge and is working on how bacteria and other pathogens infect the, infect the human body and how our body responds to that threat. Sir, I now request you to kindly start with your discussion for today's webinar. Uh, am I audible to everybody? Yes, sir, you're audible. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Vashkar, for yes, this uh, fantastic uh, introduction. And I should also thank uh, Dr. Ratna Kirpani, the principal uh, conveners and organizers for giving me this opportunity to uh, talk to a sort of a 
different audience that I'm generally used to. And uh, I should first apologize because I'm not an expert in environmentalism uh, and I'm not an expert uh, in, in also uh, political science. But what I can give you is a, a sort of a scientific perspective of uh, the problems that we are facing today and uh, why we are facing it today. And uh, so what I'll start by doing is uh, I'll share the presentation that I have and uh, let's see if it works. Hold on, sorry. Okay, can you see the slides? Yes, sir, carry on. Okay, <clears throat> fantastic. So, um, as Vashkar pointed out, I am a molecular biologist and I work with uh, human pathogens and also how they infect uh, human beings and what measures we generally take uh, or, or we study how the body actually, uh, you know, sort of restores the balance and fights the infection. So. Uh, so this is a very relevant topic today uh, because uh, we are undergoing, we are sort of going through the pandemics, uh, which is the coronavirus uh, pandemic of 2019, started in 2019. So I thought I will give you some basic biology before I go into the uh, impact it has on the society and how the society has changed and modified its behavior uh, in both utilizing the natural resources or uh, and actually not paying any attention to how they should be actually using the natural resources. Uh, and that has caused us troubles over the years. So uh, please bear with me for the first few slides where the first one would be to, uh, okay. So the way I have structured the talk is basically I'll have three versions, three sections where the first section would deal with uh, what is the cause of the pandemic and how it affects our body. And the second one would be a brief history of the pandemic, how, how over the years and millennia it has affected the human race and why it has affected and how it has influenced the societal structure and also its uh, ability to use resources. Uh, and also what are the lasting effects of the pandemics over the uh, human history and how did society change and what is the sustainability uh, and the last part would be a brief idea about sustainability and pandemics how they can uh, sort of why sustainability is important and how pandemics play a role in in uh, sort of pointing us towards a better sustainable model of utilizing and exploiting the natural resources so as we all know that uh, sir sorry sorry right. to interrupt you. please please maximize the screen or go through slides uh, mode okay is it okay now yes sir right now okay fantastic so yeah so uh a very basic biology as we all know now by 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 now that uh most of the pandemics are not all but most of them are caused by viruses and they're extremely small particles and a few of the examples that we have uh, is influenza we are very aware of that smallpox uh, Ebola, HIV, and polio, we have all heard about it. Um, and they are generally, uh, there is no medicine to cure viral infections. So if you have a viral infection, it will have to be dealt with by your body and no medicine can help you. There are a few uh, vaccines available, some antivirals available, uh, but not in an extensive way. Uh, but we have cures uh, for, anti for, for bacterial infections with antibiotics but they are ineffective for viral infection. So we do not actually have any defense except for the natural immunity that we have within our body against the viruses. And that is a biggest problem. Uh, and I'll come to that point as why uh, maintaining a healthy relationship with the environment is absolutely paramount in uh, stopping un unwanted uh, viruses infecting us. So, 
so there's been a question that whether the virus uh, that is circulating right now is man-made or what kind of things and so lots of lots of opinions floating around uh, in, in social media in, in general public opinion so let me put it to that to rest and say that viruses evolve over time and they have uh, a tremendously fast life cycle so they can uh, go through uh, a life cycle in like uh, in matter of days so and people are also aware of the 1918 spanish flu it's, it's just a common uh, household term now so it started with some some virus coming from the birds to the humans and as you can see over here the first sequences they had certain bits and pieces uh, of genes which would be important to infect the humans so what could, what what followed was another influenza outbreak in 1957 where the virus was actually a combination of a new virus and this old virus so they mixed up made something else and it continued in 1968 there's another hong kong influenza virus uh, epidemic fortunately very localized uh, that also is another combination of the previous two. What we have now is basically a combination of various other coronaviruses that are already circulating and already we have faced and we already know they're existing. So the novelty is basically not as much, but it's basically the way it's transmitted and the way it's, in, it's infectiousness is what is uh, taken us by surprise to find us. So, uh, as, and we all know how the COVID-19 spread by now, we are quite, uh, quite well educated. So it's by droplet transmission. And if the droplet is uh, a new sort of uh, infect, the, in, the infected person touches something or the droplet fall on some surfaces, if you touch and then go to your nose and mucosal surfaces like eyes and uh, your, your mouth, you get infected in your lungs. So this is where the site of respiratory viral infection and what is the outcome of that. So this is your lungs, basically, what you're seeing here. And the highlighted region is basically the end point uh, of your lungs where the gas is actually exchanged between blood and the outer uh, atmosphere. And the virus actually attacks here. So as you can see on the top, this is a healthy uh, sort of a lung where you have uh, normal spaces and stuff like that. And then when the virus infects these areas, it fills with fluid. So your lungs cannot perform their, uh, their function of gaseous exchange, and you feel a very heavy chest. You cough a lot. Uh, that's because your, heart, your, your, your lungs is trying to get as much uh, air out from outside as possible. And uh, as and when the case uh, goes from bad to worse, your heart, your, your, sorry, your, your lungs is actually filled with fluid and you can't breathe. And at the end, you die out of suffocation. So this is the pathology of, of, the, of the infection that happens. And this is quite common uh, infection. It happens with influenza. It happens with uh, other coronaviruses as well. But the, 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 the rate at which this happens is, is pretty high for this particular uh, virus. Okay, so now that's a basic brief history uh, of, of, of the biology. How prevalent are pandemics in, 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 in human history? And I think many of us would be very surprised to know that it's not the only time that we have seen pandemics. It's like with us for ages. And it started, the first reported uh, sort of pandemic started in Athens, which is like ancient Greek. Uh, and they were a very important city-state, very wealthy, very organized. They discovered democracy in Athens. But what happened was they had an a, a outbreak of typhoid fever in, in, in their thing, uh, in their middle, and that actually weakened the Athenians significantly, and they were defeated by the Spartans, which is another city-state in Greece. So as you can see, already it has started to show, the pandemics have started to show their effects on the politics of the world, at the world stage. A few hundred years later, uh, there was another plague called uh, An uh, Antonine Plague, which actually claimed the uh, Roman Emperor, uh, Emperor Marcus Aurelius, which is the most, which is a very famous uh, of, uh, sort of Roman Emperor. And uh, again, that caused the Roman Empire to be in chaos. Then came another few hundred years later, the Cyprian plague, where the people had now, by, by now they know what to do with the plagues. They were 
people from the cities were trying to escape to the country. And by doing so, what they did was to spread the disease through every part of the, of, 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 of the country. And it also was a very big problem in Western Europe. It was in Britain. And it also stopped them from protecting themselves from the, 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 the Scots and the Picts, which is the Scotland. So they're separate at that point of time. So basically what I'm trying to say is they, this pandemic actually hampered uh, your ability to protect yourself. And if somebody basically attacks you at that point when you are low, uh, you, you will lose. And you will lose control over your entire political uh, uh, sort of uh, spectra. So again, there's another uh, Roman plague, which is called the Justinian plague, which actually uh, caused the rise of Christianity. So as you would, as I will sort of tell you later on, that religious, religion and pandemics are, have very close connections, not always in the good, good in, in, a, in a good way. So leprosy in the 11th century was another uh, sort of an issue which had the which people thought was a punishment from the God. And I think it's still believed today that it's something that we have still uh, to get rid of. Uh, but that pandemic is still ongoing. People don't talk about it because we have certain uh, disease, uh, uh, sort, of, uh, sort of disease combating medicines by antibiotics, but that pandemic is still ongoing. Then comes the very famous Black Death of Europe, which actually changed the geopolitical landscape of Britain and France and the whole of Western Europe. They changed the British feudal system had collapsed because uh, there was an uprising against the draconian laws uh, drafted in by the politicians at that time uh, to stop the pandemic. Then it has killed mostly the Vikings. They have stopped their uh, attacks uh, everywhere. So their em empire had collapsed because of this particular Black Death. France was extremely hard hit. Uh, almost 70% of its population was dead. Uh, it was pretty bad. And still like 500 million people infected and 20 to 50 million dead. A uh, big, big number. And then another problem with, with the pandemics is if you are, uh, if you didn't have this kind of diseases before and somebody brings it to your country, then the entire population is going to die. There is no stopping that. And that's exactly what has happened in, in the Latin Americans when the uh, Christopher Columbus first went there. So they, they not only uh, found the new world, they also uh, in, sort of gave them uh, the nasty diseases from the euro. And what has happened was the population was, the indigenous population was decimated. The Aztec empire was destroyed by smallpox because they didn't have any immunity against it. And the Spanish colonizers could actually do their job because of these diseases that they brought in. Uh, so, so as you can see, the, over the years, and this is another example, Great Plague of London, a tremendous uh, number of human casualties. So again, what is interesting in respect to India was the cholera pandemic. So cholera is caused not by a virus, by a bacteria, and uh, by unhygienic situations and mixing of fecal matters with water. Uh, but it started uh, in India, or it started in Russia and then came to India, and then was spread all over the world by the Britishers by their extremely well organized navy uh, and, the, uh, and the empire. Uh, but by the time they were there, 150,000 people were killed, uh, mostly in India. And India was really, really badly, badly hit. And it also actually gave rise to a sort of rebellion in China, uprising in India, because there were very un unpopular things happening in, in Bombay, where uh, they had uh, sort of burned down houses and separated families. Uh, it was a nightmare. So, but that carried on for a while uh, till we got it under control. 1918, the 25th century, and we have this Spanish flu, which I'm not going to talk because we all know what happened. Uh, another pandemic that is still ongoing uh, is the HIV AIDS community. Again, this has started from a sort of developed from a chimpanzee virus that crossed over to the humans. Uh, there are discussions about how it crossed over to the humans, um, and there are sort of repercussions for that particular notion that people have 
Uh, and then came the SARS virus in 2003, which was again another coronavirus that came from the bats uh, to the humans. Again, how did how did it get here is another question that needs to be debated. And 2019, we have the COVID-19, uh, the SARS uh, cousin of uh, SARS virus, which is basically uh, another virus from the bats that has come to the humans. So as you can see, most of these viruses or bacteria, they are not generally targeting the humans, but they are mostly for uh, the animals. But the humans are so, uh, I would say, uh, they love to go into other places. They love to conquer. They, they would love to settle in places where they should not be settling. And that would bring them in direct contact with wild animals. <clears throat> they love to domesticate wild animals. And with domestication comes all the viruses, all the diseases of, of those uh, sort of animals. And we, have, we are pretty much defenseless against those kind of new diseases that come up. So the, the, that's the history of pandemics. But how does it affect the society? So there are, uh, are a few uh, aspects of the pandemic effect. So one is on public psyche. Like how would the, the general public behave when there is a pandemic declared. The most important thing and the first thing that people would feel was terror and panic. So people would get terrorized because uh, it, 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 people you would see people getting died and infected uh, and losing their loved ones. So it's obvious that they would panic. And as we have seen in the in, around the world in India as well, there's mass panic buying, stockpiling, social and psychological distancing from neighbors or other human beings. So it's basically trying to make a wall against uh, everybody else and keeping your family safe within that. So this is sort of a, has a negative social impact, which I'll talk on a little later. And then the quest for understanding, because we also want to know what's going on, and you should you would fall prey to false and propagandist news. So anybody and everybody becomes an expert, and then you fall prey, and you start to believe in things that are not true. Uh, the other thing is uh, religiosity. So people generally are uh, sort of uh, religious, uh, wh whoever wants to be. And during a disaster, even the most non-religious person becomes a quite a religious uh, person because they want to have the problem solved by the God. And unfortunately, God is a concept and it doesn't have the power to cure you uh, of everything. And then the God-man fills in the uh, in sort of the uh, things and then starts to do all sorts of stuff like sacrificing animals to different cures and uh, all the potions. Um, and this actually leads to religious intolerance. And this religious intolerance is very, very important in multi-religion country uh, like India. And this also can be uh, multi sort of against the different cultures. Like we have different cultures in the Northeast. If, uh, we have different cultures in, 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 in the forested regions and other places. So people think that those people are spreading more because they are you know, sort of in a different geographical area. So we need to be careful of that. The other effect pandemic has is basically trying to flee the urban spaces because it has been shown that urban spaces are sort of breeding ground for these viruses and uh, it, it spreads much more easily. It is quite understandable because you live in a city, in a compact space. You have day-to-day -day contact with other human beings which, who can be infected. So the number of cases would rise in an urban space much more easily. Uh, and over the time, it has been shown that the cities were not well planned. The, the sanitation was not great. So it, it sort of increasing the risk of uh, infection even further. And uh, also there is uh, sort of a complete disconnect uh, from the nature from uh, when you live in a city. So you have absolutely no idea how to combat this through natural uh, natural ways. So this, this, this disconnect is also important, but people realize that if I can go out to the countryside or to the forest and keep by myself, then probably I will be safe. Now, this is very important and I'll come to it uh, a bit later. Again, as I would say that religious intolerance also increases in the society at this particular uh, point of disaster. Uh, and in the past human history, what we've shown that pandemics have 
uh, always, always, invariably being uh, blamed upon the minorities uh, of the uh, of the particular country, and like Jews and Muslims in the last uh, pandemic during the Black Plague in Europe has been condemned, and then there are also LGBT. Communities that are ostracized during the HIV pandemics because of their uh, sort of sexual orientations and their practices, but that was not true. What we understand now is a completely different story. But they, the minorities and the people who are different from us, were actually being uh, ostracized at that particular point. There's also an effect on governance, like regulations. What kind of uh, sort of during the Black Death in Europe? The first time governments institutionalized health magistrates, which turned out to be the health ministries of today. Previous to that, people had absolutely no control over how you dealt with your life, what was your health. That was not a concern of the state. But post the Black Death situation, it basically became the matter and the concern of the state to look after the health so that uh, it is not decimated. The whole uh, population is not decimated by some uh, new infection. Um, but it, it has some good things as well. But what also happened at that point of time was the intention was good, but the execution was so poor uh, because there was no medical care whatsoever. So government would basically separate people from their families, trying to control their lives uh, and put them into quarantines where there was no medical care and that's why they would actually die so it was a death sentence and that's how the number of cases increased during black, uh, black death uh, as well border control is another concept that has its origins in the pandemic of the past so previous to the plague in europe absolutely nothing actually stopped you from going from one political sphere to the other political sphere other countries or other geographical area but post that for the Black Death, the government or the politicians started controlling who can come in because potentially you could carry a new infection. And now we know the, by the visa regime today that if we have to go to some other countries, we have to get vaccinations, we have to have medical checks and all sorts of stuff. This, so the origins of this idea of the new controlling state comes from the pandemics. Um, social control is another very interesting stuff. Uh, and people, in power actually love to control the lives of their subjects. And actually the pandemics give them the perfect reason to do just that. Uh, so in the Middle Ages, the, the Italians and the, uh, Naples governments had uh, the early contact tracers. Now we all know the contact tracers are basically who would find out who is infected and take uh, relevant measures. Uh, so those contact tra tra tracers would go to house every house uh, and then take out the infected person and quarantine them. Uh, but they would mostly die. But it also went up to a point where they would be isolating the entire households with door markings, even burning of houses which were infected. Like that is the draconian uh, measures that they took. And the start of government surveillance on social, uh, or, 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 on, on the society started with the pandemics as well. In terms of having a citizen's register, that we all know now because we have a census and we have all sorts of stuff in different countries. And in the old ages, there was actually a roll call taken every evening so as to count for how many people have been dead or infected from the previous day. And listening to this, you could imagine that the same thing is happening exactly now in, in all over the world. Every day we get a figure of how many people have been infected, how many people have, 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 have been dead. This is only possible when the, the government have exact control over its population. Okay, so what's on the political landscape? Coming to the political uh, effects of pandemics is the most important thing is the uprisings. Because pandemics are breeding ground of draconian laws. So the laws are so bad that you wouldn't stand them in normal times. But during pandemics, people give it give the government a lot of rope, a lot of leeway, and that means we sort of gave away our social liberty. We happily stay indoors under lockdowns, uh, and that uh, is okay. But sometimes this is done with force and discrimination. Now imagine if only a certain classes of people were allowed to do their job, and not the others, and that was enforced with force, then 
that, that, that class, that suppressed class, would uh, be in uprising. And that is exactly what had happened in the lower class uprising against the British in India during the Bombay cholera pandemic. And it has also shown its uh, effect the, of the uprising of the peasants during the feudal lords in Britain, which was completely destroyed the feudal system in, in, the, in, in Britain at that point of time. And another very important thing that happens during pandemic is the authorities are questioned. Now, mostly faith leaders, as well as the political class, are questioned about how they're dealing with it. And this questioning is multifaceted. People are questioning how uh, we have ended up having such a pandemic, uh, because how did you handle the environmental policies? How did you uh, handle the sanitation issues? How did you... So basically, everything that the government does is under question. Uh, the rich are also questioned about their reluctance to help pe people in distress. And so the entire system uh, shows all their weaknesses during such a disaster. And uh, people also try to sort of go for uh, <clears throat> sort of their uh, solace in God and try to have an answer. But unfortunately, they couldn't find it. Uh, and that's why people also lose faith very fast during this kind of disaster. Now, on human development, uh, pandemics ha in general has a, sort of a good effect because because of the pandemics, we have uh, running clean running water in most of the Western world, uh, and uh, the, all the emerging countries like India, China, they're aspiring uh, to provide that. We have. Uh, proper planning of sewage planning, proper drainage, proper roads, or the concept of hospital and having sick people in one place to be cared for uh, all starts with the Black Death in Europe. So the pandemics have the, a very major impact on how humans actually developed their medical system. Science, as we know, or the medical science rather, as we know, starts because people need answers uh, and uh, ways to control this pandemic. So people started to ask the questions as to why this has happened, how this has happened, and how can we stop it? So that is sort of the forebearer, the forefather of the, problem, the current medical science. And scientific progress starts. People start asking questions. Vaccines against the, the, the viruses or the bacteria uh, are developed over the ages. So yes, pandemics do help in human development as well. It's basically a survival strategy of the humans. But coming to the last part of the talk, and this is the most interesting to the audience, is sustainability and the pandemic. So as Joshua Lord, Ned Lederberg, he's a Nobel laureate in, in, in physiology and medicine, has pointed out that human beings are no doubt the most dominant species, but the greatest threat to that dominance comes from the viruses. And this is a very, very pertinent point as we can, as you can see right now. So entire world, entire, the most populous country, the most richest country, they're all decimated by a virus which even can't even see. So coming to why this is now a problem. The, out of the 550 gigacarbon tons of biomass that is distributed all over the planet, we contribute only like a minuscule amount, we can't even do the percentage of that. But has influenced, we have influenced every niche of this planet. We have not spared a single inch of the planet with our influence. And so much so that geologists have now named this epoch or the time that we are age uh, is Anthropocene or the age of the humans, which is quite a substantial uh, sort of achievement by a species, uh, by one species of the planet. Uh, then the reasons for humans' astonishing success are due to advent of agriculture, industrial revolution, which is extremely resource in intensive, and domestication of wild animals and then the propagation of that. So as you all know, agriculture in the current form is extremely resource intensive and it basically destroys the natural habitat. It needs a lot of space and a lot of natural resource like water. Uh, so basically, we, when we start farming, we sort of start harming the nature already. Uh, and if we do it in a large scale, we are in big trouble because how do you get space for agriculture? You have to clear, the, clear out the forest. And when you clear out the forest, where does the animals or the forest go? They don't go anywhere and they come in contact with you. 
And that contact is not good because with the contact comes all the diseases of the animals which can, which now have the potential to infect us and sort of potentially kill us. Industrial revolution happened in Britain and then it basically uh, started the whole process of consumption, uh, movement towards the industrial uh, uh, mining, which is one of the biggest thing of industrial revolution. The raw materials came from within the earth. For mining, we need land or we need the stuff that is under the forest cover. So millions and millions of hectares of forest cover had been removed just to get to what is beneath them which is like coal iron ore uh, a any raw material that you can think of africa the democratic republic of congo which is the most richest country in the world for its uh, for its resources uh, for natural resources is also the most uh, corrupt and also the most uh, I would say, uh, unsustainable country in the entire world, uh, mainly run by uh, uh, gang lords trying to fight over their rights. So as you can see, these all, so our basically progress, as you define it, as the humans define it as the, at this point, comes at a cost. And this cost, now we are paying the cost. We have been, we, we had, the last pandemic was sort of in, in 1918, 100 years back, we are sort of, the, the, the memory has faded, but now the problem of sustainability and our progress is in, in sharp relief. People would be uh, pressed to see that, uh, is this actual progress? Is this what we want? So that is the question people are asking with sustainability. <clears throat> and thanks to pandemics, <clears throat> this has been put into uh, sort of our focus very clearly and very sharply. So there are uh, uh, sort of uh, environmentalism activists all over the world, everywhere, like Greta Thunberg here, the Extension Rebellion people in the UK, uh, all sorts of people trying to push us towards the fact to understand that what we are doing is not sustainable. But did we listen? No. Now the pandemic is the right time to show that we have to listen for the sustainability of our own species and for our children. Again, so... Animal spillover accounts for up two thirds of all human infectious diseases. So what that means is humans have a limited range of uh, sort of bugs that are, are bacteria, viruses that can infect us. But we import a lot more from animal sources, from animals which we should not have been in contact with. Animals which we should have been left in the forest and never seen are now our neighbors and sort of that's why all the diseases that they have are also coming to us. In a 2008 study for emerging infectious diseases by uh, the World Health Organization, they showed that this particular emerging uh, pathogens is basically from the animals, the wild animals that we come constantly in contact with. And it would be increasing over time because we are expanding our sort of land resources, land usage, decreasing forest cover, decreasing habitats, fragmenting uh, habitats. So what, what will happen is more and more people will come in contact with wild animals, more and more people or mostly marginal people <clears throat> without the means of supporting themselves will depend more and more on uh, the wild animals uh, and the forests for their day-to-day -day living. And they would start, and if they actually have a contact with the human society of the actual bigger bigger society and cities they will infect us as as we have overseen uh, in the case of china that there are lots of small markets which actually sell a lot of wild animals unchecked unregulated and then that those viruses come to us and also uh, so the zoonotic disease is basically uh, the term zoonosis means uh, anything that comes from the animals to us and the capacity of viruses to jump from one animal, uh, let's say a bat or a, or a camel or anything, to us is extremely high because they can change very fast and they can gain new uh, sort of uh, attributes, new, 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 new capabilities very, very fast. So if you don't keep them separated, we will be infected. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and also climate change, which is uh, one of the biggest threats that humankind faces. Uh, we are responsible for that. There is no doubt about that. Uh, what has happened is 
the species, all the species are moving uh, from their previous positions in, in, in the ecology to a different side. So basically the latitude has been changed, their, their migration patterns have changed, their habitats have been changed. So, and because we are also encroaching upon their land, we are again coming in contact with them more and more. So it's a two-pronged problem. We are changing the climate so that the animals have to move to a different location, but we are already there. We are already occupying that space. So there's a direct conflict between humans and all other species in this world. So of course, we are expected to have this kind of problems. In the 2017 review in the Science Journal, we had, it has been categorically shown that there are 40,000 species globally uh, that are already on the move from warmer to cooler climates. <clears throat> and so basically, this mass movement carries with it the, the, the challenges and the viruses and the bacteria and the sickness and the diseases that they have. And if we come in contact with them, we will be infected. And sort of bats are sort of everywhere. And bats, uh, as an animal, they have a particular tendency of harboring viruses because bats are immune to all sorts of known viruses. They don't have the system. They don't have a problem with viruses like we do. So, and bats are everywhere and we destroy the bats habitats, bats natural habitats, uh, and that's why we get in contact with them through bites of animals or direct uh, exposure to bad bites. So we are sort of inviting trouble for ourselves. And uh, most of the viruses that have caused pandemics in the last few years, or decades like the SARS in 2002, MERS in 2009, Ebola in 1971, Nipah virus, Hendra virus, SARS virus, everything has come from the bat. So we need to be extra careful around bats. But that doesn't mean that bats are the problem. We are the problem because we are taking up the bat space. They are supposed to be separate, but we don't let them be separate anymore. OK, so well, again, the problem is extreme high rates of population growth, as I, I think what uh, uh, Dr. Rathnaker pointed out very uh, eloquently early on, that the pressure on the environment is increasing day by day. And that's the population growth. And related to that is the climate change and extremely high rates of greenhouse gas emissions, which are predicted to have an effect on this epidemics and pan pan pandemics over the years. So what experts are suggesting that the uh, recurrence of these pandemics is going to be faster. If it happened 100 years, sort of uh, uh, with a gap on period of 100 years, now it will happen in 20 to 30 or 50 years. Every 50 years we'll have a pandemic because we are creating these problems of our own. And in another problem with climate change is we are destroying the permafrost, the permanent snowy uh, sort of tombs of carbon. In 2020, January, very recent, Researchers have found out viruses from ice core samples from a glacier in Tibet, which is like 15,000 years old. And these viruses, you can imagine, they can actually be revived to be infectious. And we have absolutely no idea what kind of viruses they are, right? So the problem is, if we continue with our greenhouse gas emissions, if we continue burning our forests, if we continue to do the climate change and go uh, our businesses as normal, then what will happen is not only we have the animals from the forest giving us problems, we'll have the old viruses, which are sort of entombed in our snowy permafrost, come to life. And we have absolutely no idea. There's no, rel no prevalence. There's no basically idea about where, how to deal with them, where they came from. Uh, and it's a complete Pandora's box. And we do not want to do that. And also, latest reports saying that people are so desperate in the sort of villages outside of Inner Mongolia, uh, Chinese Mongolia and, and Russia, that there is uh, also an interesting thing of uh, uh, case of anthrax, bubonic plague, which is similar to the Black Death in Europe, the same stuff. Why, why is that so? Because people are getting uh, sort of infected from wild reindeer that they have hunted wild means that they have hunted and, uh, and consumed. So this is a problem. Again, 
we have ultraviolet light, like very hot uh, areas. Oxygen and high temperature are basically very bad for most of the bacteria and viruses mostly. But they do thrive in cold and dark. So that means when the frost or the ice melts, we have in our hands a tremendous amount of new viruses against which we do not have any control. So we can expect, if we go about our lives right now the way it is, to expect more and more of these pandemics in the future. And just to uh, wind up things and not allow to you too much, is pandemics appear for a reason. The reason is that the host population like us, humans, have crossed the level of sustainability that the planet could actually absorb. Now, coming back to Dr. Panikar's very, uh, uh, Ratnakar Panikar's fantastic uh, de demonstration that the early on, that the sustainability level has been breached. So we are well above the sustainable limit. The pressure is extremely high. So there's nat nature's general way of population control of keeping things under check is through this kind of mass, exting mass extinction event. But we are humans, we are resourceful, we are trying uh, our level best to fight against it. But uh, will we be successful? That's a question for the future. And we have been extremely good at upsetting the balance of nature. And when we go back to normal after pandemic, it's imperative uh, for all the people who are involved in, so, uh, in a sort of environmental protection and uh, how we go about doing it, uh, because it's a very difficult question to answer. We should not stop the growth for our future generations, but growth has to be redefined as to what we mean by growth. What is a happiness index other than the global domestic product or the consumption index? So how are we going to, going to do about that? So what, again, to conclude my talk, I would again quote another vaccine developer, Edward Jenner, who eradicated smallpox through his vaccine, is the deviation of man from the state in which he was originally placed by nature seems to have proved to him a prolific source of diseases. So with this, I would thank everybody for giving me this opportunity to paint the picture as to the how pandemics and environmental issues are interlinked and how we should think about uh, protecting our environment so that in a sort of a way which we protect ourselves, our future generations, so that we can sustainably survive you know, on this small little plan that we have uh, because we do, there's no plan B. So I think with this, I will uh, sort of end my uh, talk and I'll take more questions if there is. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for enlightening us with your vast knowledge. It was a very enriching lecture and I'm sure our participants have gained a lot from you. Without losing much time, we will now take a few questions from our participants. I would request Professor Kiporna Ganguly to please let us know if there are any questions. Uh, thank you, Bhaskar. Uh, thank you, sir, for this excellent presentation. And uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, let's start with our uh, head of the Department of Political Science, Professor Piali Seth. Uh, she came up with two questions uh, like, can we expect the changes in environment to change the nature of pandemics? Or does variables like global warming, carbon emissions, and such other things lead to growth in frequency of pandemics or its nature? Now, I guess, sir, uh, towards the end of your lecture, you already answered that, like, uh, we are expecting uh, a pandemic in every 50 years, I guess. So uh, I would just like to add uh, a link to it that, uh, can you, like, uh, how can we cope with that? any insight yes that's uh <laughs> that's the question for uh, i think a lot of people would try to uh, answer uh, i am not a, i'm not an expert in how to deal with that uh, what i can tell is basically uh, what i feel personally is if we keep on consuming and if we uh, let our lives be dictated by consumerism and uh, material consumerism then we would we would be in trouble again uh, and pretty soon so what we have to understand is how do we be how do we be happy? Because happiness is something that you cannot buy uh, with money, right? And uh, most people, unfortunately, at this age, try to find happiness by having uh, a great many things. Buying stuff brings you happiness, 
which is the worst way of getting happy. So what we understand now, and also we need to teach our next generation that uh, without being disrespectful to the, to, 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 to the nature, to the environment, how to embrace that and how to have a sustainable life uh, with that. So I think it comes down to individual behavior, individual idea of happiness, and uh, the faster we understand that uh, sort of gulping up every single resource that the planet has to offer uh, is not the best way uh, because I was because I have a four year old kid like my son is just four years old and I was wondering uh, by the time he is 80 years old in 2080 or 2000 to 2100 uh, how would the world look like and it was quite a, a sort of a shock to me because the predictions are dire means already we are running out of a lot of resources that are central to our uh, existence like the oil uh, all the uh, sort of coal and everything that we are running out and also we are polluting our our, our environment with stuff that cannot be uh, easily taken off and also i would i like to add to the point that we need to act fast because even if we stop today doing everything like doing everything we are not burning any coal not burning any uh, any oil stopping our greenhouse gases it will take 50 to 60 years just to go to the go back to a normal sustainable carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere and another 50 to 60 years to stop the temperature from rising so i think we need to act fast we need to understand that going normal back to the normal is not going to be a way to go forward uh, again I, I think uh, the, the, the eminent speaker before me uh, had pointed out that who is going to be responsible and who is going to take care of who actually does this. But we as individuals and uh, sort of partners in our own development have to come forward and uh, help with that. Nobody, no government, nobody can help us with that. We need to take control on our, in our own hands and try to modify our behavior so that our kids and their kids can survive. You're right, sir. Uh, coming to the next question, it's from uh, Mr. Shonjoy Vishash, that uh, can you elaborate on how minorities as a community is affected during pandemics? Absolutely. So the minorities are affected because they're easy targets right so if you have a problem the like if, so the virus let me be clear the virus doesn't uh, discriminate based on what religion you are what creed you are what color you are so it infects everybody but the problem with human beings is that if you are uh, more in number and uh, other people are less in number uh, what you tend to do is to point fingers at other people and it's been extremely well done. It's been extremely well documented over the historical pandemics. The Jews in the middle, uh, sort of the Middle Ages, has been crucified because they were thought to be the bringers, uh, because they were traders. Uh, they used to, people used to think that they would bring the disease to them. Uh, so what has happened is, if you have a religious minority or even other kind of minorities uh, in, in, in your society, uh, you tend to point fingers towards that because first thing, you do not know what's causing the problem. So the human trend is to point fingers, is to find a scapegoat to blame, to find an answer because humans cannot stay without an answer. So in doing so, people point fingers and the easiest people to point fingers to are the minorities because they have low in numbers, they have no voice whatsoever and uh, it, it happens everywhere. So I would say the minorities in India has been uh, sort of pointed out, the minorities in the UK where I live, which is unfortunately all the other religions except the Christianity, they have also been pointed out to be uh, one of the sort of pools and reservoirs and they don't behave properly, they don't uh, listen to the, um, what should I say, the government regulations, they, they go out, they mingle. So it's all over the world. It's always the minorities who don't have the voice are always pointed at and said, that you are the reason, so you should take the more of a blame, and that's how it, it happens. So it's across the world. But again, this is to us to change that and to understand that it's not not the minorities, it's all of us. It's, so so that, that should answer the question, I think. 
Uh, one last question. It's from uh, Mr. Yes. Koshi Ganguly. Uh, that yeah. contrary to popular wisdom, urban slums in India have fought the coronavirus spread in a better way than upper middle class localities, despite the huge gap in quality of life. Your insights, please. Yes, um, good question, Koshi. Unfortunately, I have uh, no particular experience in this, but what I think is again. Uh, based on the fact that people who have a little more money think that they are immune and they can do whatever they want to do and they have a general tendency uh, to go against the, gen the, the, the rules. Uh, sometimes it's good because sometimes you do need to go against the rules but given the situation it's uh, highly important that people keep and uh, sort of basically uh, I, would, uh, I would say stick to the rules as they have been told. So that is the reason I think why slums have been easily controlled because you can control them easily with, with your police force, with your uh, sort of political uh, dadas and everybody. So people listen, people listen to the, the powerful. But when you are upper middle class or even middle class uh, family, you tend to have uh, idea that uh, those rules are not for you. You, with your money and your kind of connections and power, you can do whatever you want to do. And that is the, probably the reason why you have uh, more cases in high-rise buildings than in slums, which is co co contrary to the other belief. Um, and also, I, could, I must point out another non-societal uh, thing is, if you're in a, in a high-rise, uh, then the possibility of your interactions also do increase a lot. Uh, you, in, you actually use a, co a lot of common spaces, uh, the lifts uh, are common and everything is common. So if you do not uh, actually uh, stick to the rules and hygiene measures, it's very likely that you're going to spread the disease uh, more. So yeah, a combination of uh, sort of sense of invincibility and sense of uh, and living in close quarters uh, actually make things worse for high rise. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, so we don't have any more questions at the moment. Uh, That's fine. So That's I would fine. like. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, so I would thank like you very much. Bashkar to. Yeah, most welcome. So Bashkar, uh, over to you. Thank you once again, sir. I would now introduce Professor. Obhijit Kundu, our final renowned speaker for today's webinar. He has retired as an adjunct professor of environment and geoinformatics from the Birla Institute of Technology, MISRA. He also worked as a scientific consultant for disaster management research projects in Jadavpur University. Professor Obhijit Kundu had prepared the disaster management state plan of the West Bengal government for the year 2008 to 2009, and again later for 2009 to 2010. He has also headed projects in Northeast coal fields on coal mining and environment under Coal India Limited. He has worked as a personal secretary of parliamentary affairs from 2009 to 2014. Professor Kundu was also the project head in Dokkin Dinajpur Hilly Model Block for State Rural Livelihoods Mission, Anandadhara, and was also a part of three NABAD projects Presently, he is working as the secretary of Ichamuti Society for Human Welfare and Relations, an NGO established in 2001. Sir, I now request you to please enrich us with your knowledge and experience. Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. Hello. Okay. Yes, sir, you are audible. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everyone. So, we came in the last point and uh, uh, I was used to these type of seminars, uh, but not in this mode, uh, usually in the hall and the colleges and universities. And uh, we always thank the last speaker and post lunch speaker, because these two are vital. After lunch, uh, everybody is in a different mode. So uh, the speaker got some relief that uh, nobody will take the speech so seriously and <laughs> the last one because you know this is not sustainable uh, our patients 
and it started from 4 pm so we have already spent two and uh, uh, two hours and 40 minutes over this uh, digital situation and i am also new uh, in this digital situation anyway i will <laughs> do not want to waste your time because you are all working uh, in a good condition and young age and i wish to all of you a uh, very good with a post pandemic period so now let us start now <clears throat> the issue is uh, environmentalism and issues of sustainability and public participation now i used to uh, taught, uh, teach uh, environment and you know environment itself uh, a multidisciplinary subject i was from mainly geology background background and geoinformatics that is gis and remote sensing and uh, many different but i used to uh, also uh, part of the other environmental engineering subjects like uh, uh, it is a di different parameters like air pollution air pollution water pollution waste management there are different aspects uh, water pollution especially we worked also uh, to find out different chemicals uh, like aromatic hydrocarbons from sediments in the Ganges from Noihati to uh, uh, Sagar Island. Uh, we traced the whole passage of the river and collected the sediments. There are there are so di different issues. But the thing is that that environmentalism is quite different, you know. Uh, environmentalism is quite different from this environment. Uh, what kind of difference? Uh, I want to explain some of the points. Environment means there are two things. Uh, one is social environment we are living together with our neighbors and with our relatives friends and now in this uh, mode it is totally a uh, global environment social environment and another is uh, what we call material world that is physical chemical and all biotic factors which is termed as environment and on environment uh, we study different types of degradation like we take a standard of air pollution parameters like carbon dioxide, oxygen, nitrogen, nitrous oxide, methane, and so on, so on. Like even particulate matters of different sizes, like PM10, PM2.5, which is most dangerous, like that. And also for water pollution, all these parameters, pH, that is the acidity level, also toxic metals, the presence of toxic metals within the water which we drink or within the food which we take intake through our metabolic process how much toxicity we gained and how what to do about that and about waste management there are different types of waste medical waste are treated differently in uh, urban area there are municipal waste solid waste also liquid waste there are different ways for the treatment there's a vast area which are under the municipalities and uh, till date i think you all observe that no such uh, organized uh, waste management system is there working at present there are trying they are trying in corporation areas it is all right but in municipal areas and suburban especially suburban areas and in village and in rural areas uh, i think the, they have their own system it is not the government or not from the higher authority who is controlling the waste management. There are so different issues. We are waste um, regularly, religiously. We uh, are destroying the environment of the rivers uh, from industrial output, from industrial waste. And uh, yes, there is a statutory body of the government. And I was closely linked to that. Even in, at present, uh, that is uh, <laughs> Pollution Control Board, Central Pollution Control Board is there. A state pollution control board is there and uh, one of my dada my younger uh, one and i am very good friend of also very close to each other now chairman of the west bengal pollution control board dr kulan rudro i i spoke to him also on environment i am coming to the issue before before that uh, let us uh, talk to some you know after retirement i want i uh, got a scope so how i i should <laughs> not used to it. So Kolanda asked me, Obijit, uh, he actually he was religiously working on the rivers, 
especially the Bengal Delta and its river system. He, um, uh, Reynolds, uh, the oldest map, he recovered that through uh, Oxford University. And at present, I think they published it also. And it is available in London. Here is it, it is also available. He asked me one thing. Now, we are always determining that so the river will go in this way. We will take a uh, uh, guard on this, up to this. This is not the way. If the river asks me that which is my place, what is the my place, what is my area, which is my pathway, what we will answer, the human being. That is the environment, reason. What I want to say is that, that environmentalism is there, exactly in it, uh, you can, um, that is, uh, some, one thing is that, ism is something philosophical. Vaishnavism, that's which I know the first renaissance in our Bengal Delta, uh, our, you know, whatever it may be, you may have some different opinion, but people uh, uh, wrote so many articles on that. and. Is renowned anyway, so that is an ism. So, environmentalism, environment is this, and environmentalism is something different. That if forests ask wildlife, they ask human beings, Who are you? What do you think of yourself? Are you the center of interest of this biotic world? In this biotic world, there are so many species, millions of species. We have scheduled some and didn't schedule also. And if those biotic world unite in one day and ask the human being that you are controlling everything, why? Are you the center of interest? What do you think? Whole biotic world and whole the physical world, the rivers, the hydrometeorological system is running around you. For your interest, for your interest, what do you think? What will be our answer? An environmentalist, in, uh, I, in it is on, this is my uh, not personal opinion. There is a school of thought that we call it environmentalism only when we will think in this way and we will work for it, we will fight for it to till our death. As an individual, human society will exist. Like 200,000 years, they are existing, fighting all the viruses, bacteria, and everything. I think another 200 million or 200,000 years, they will survive. <clears throat> but the question is that what is environmentalism? So, another point is uh, so there are so many questions which may uh, confuse the whole thing. So environmentalism, you must define, one must define what is environmentalism. That is very important. Before you go, uh, the subject, go through the subject, inside the subject, the core of the problem. So this must be an ideology to rule. For ruling ourselves, a state, an United nation, or a human community a human as a whole, we will rule ourselves, we will uh, enact the laws, we will pass the laws in the parliament and bills. Or if for everything, we will see through the environment. Now, what is that that can be explained? So if this ism or the ism, all the main points of this ism, could be <clears throat> certain act, and if we can pass all these acts through our parliament, through our United Nations body, and then it is being implemented, then we will call it a sustainable. It is sustainable. Otherwise, we may talk it, talk about it, we may write about it, but unless we make it a movement, it, it is not possible to. Uh, apply these things. I, I thank to the first speaker, uh, Sir uh, Dr. Jha, that he gave one example, but that example explains the whole thing, the whole thing, how a people's movement 
compelled the whole state to make a law and implement it. Now, whether it will be applicable for the long time, how much time it will take to implement the whole 100% of the law, that is a different question. So this is a very important point to me. And then we come to the sustainability question. Uh, sustainability means how much it sustains. Like, uh, see, uh, the, this is almost uh, reaching we are the, uh, from 2 p.m. to uh, Hey, from 4 p.m. to almost 7, so three hours. So how much the patience of our speakers will sustain? That is the question. How much time? Another 15 minutes or 30 minutes and so on. So it is a very question. Like that, uh, what is to be sustained? The ecosystem or a particular ore like iron ore or manganese ore or coal or a particular uh, deposit of fossil fuel like coal or petroleum, anything like that, which now sustainability is a very, very uh, in the sense that uh, is it possible to uh, sustain millions of years? No. So everything is must be time bound. And you know, so what is to be sustained, that must be clear maybe within a time range and whether it is a particular ecosystem whether uh, when we think of uh, an employment and income how much it will sustain suppose one of my very close relative and some uh, two friends of him they were uh, under this situation not this situation before time they were out of their service they, I mean, I'm not naming it, but they were working in a car, car making company, very famous car making company. And it is very popular. Now they don't want to, now they want to lay off their employees because the production failed. Now in this, uh, on the, in this occasion, particularly sustainability question will come and there are some problems. If we, uh, want to solve the question piece by piece it may some it may make another problem will uh, push us push us in another future problem like in, uh, in all <clears throat> you are all acquainted with the daily pollution in the 90s and it was choking so one so it was not possible to run the cars through petrol and diesel so they made the rule cng they stopped one night there were um, Huge queues from, from the first uh, few days, few months. <clears throat> uh, because before they start the CNG. And then CNG started. The car's engines, they were modified. They are more um, um, very fuel friendly and the more uh, lightweight. But what happened? The, ha the thing is that the selling of the sale of car increases and you know in Delhi if you take a uh, one statistics 13 to 15 percent people uh, habitation habitat of Delhi they have own, they have their car own car and they make jams all over the cities so 90 percent of the street occupied by the 13 to 15 percent of the people who occupy the car that is the point. This is, could this be sustainable? This is not sustainable. So if we stop all these things, if we take only um, uh, public vehicles in new uh, mode of fuel, new mode of engine, that could be sustainable. But if we want to start that, whether it is possible or not, there will be some question. Because there are some politics, there will be some so many, so many, so many questions. It's age-old question. It's very boring also. So, <laughs> what is to be sustained? We must be clear that environmentalism and another point. I uh, I would ask the uh, organizers also that now it is also a facility to me because they actually related it with the 2030 agenda for sustainable development goals SDGs. I mean, before that it was MDG, Millennium Development Goals, and now 
uh, environmentalism and sustainable uh, issues of sustainability public participation uh, with this goal so the, this is a basically a long a very vast question to answer uh, so let me concentrate uh, for my, the last 15 minutes only on certain points that uh, why it has become unsustained we have some specific answers that because of the depletion degradation and destruction of natural force resources and these natural resources are obviously metals and non-metal deposits which we are taking from nature through mining different types of mining uh, incline mining underground mining open cast mining and there are so many so many so, many. <clears throat> so it will finish one day fossil fuels coal and petroleum we are extracting and using green cover forest we are destroying successfully not only this we are using it as a uh, resource as a wood resource like uh, there are two types of resources generally you know all these things that one is timber forest product, TFP. Another is NTFP, that is non timber forest product. And the non timber forest product, how much revenue does it give? And timber forest product, how much revenue does it give? The, whether this will uh, determine our policy to uh, um, <coughs> maximize our revenue from the forest, or we will go through an environmentalist outlook. Then we will stop all timber forest products. Only we allow certain types of uh, timber forest products when it is allowable. There are certain uh, time to cut a tree and uh, replace with that another. But non, we will wa we want to increase the non-timber forest products. Not only that, we will practice non-timber forest product production within our own uh, agricultural production system <coughs> that is a very important point so this green cover is very important like the amazon forest it is uh, what is going on you all know and uh, just um, the second figure that uh, i was in it is so rich that where they will stay the bat the bacteria, the viruses, where they will stay. So, it is really excellent to uh, think. Uh, and the second speaker was Dr. Rod, Dr. Rodi Yudhar. He explained so nicely that where they will stay. So, they will come with us. They will come live with us. So, they, when they will come, they will come with their viruses, their bacteria, their livelihood, their pattern. So, that is not a crime like we are doing so it is a quite natural thing so now we will uh, go through that another is water water stress is also there all these are natural environment the stress depression what is happening on the natural environment so that is the main point and uh, all these are non-renewable sources we all know and you know the development issue that is sustainability uh, when comes it is why related with the natural resources because without energy we cannot think the development development means energy we need energy <clears throat> first you see for every country i am just energy means through fossil fuel may may maximum energy and when it is counted when it is counted actually we count it from 1751 and uh, at around 400 billion tons from 1751 uh, only the united states he alone is it responsible for 25 percent of the total historical emissions and total european union uh, union's contribution is 22 percent there are so many examples there are so many statistics but the main thing is that per capita energy use, per capita energy use, if we think uh, just for one example, it will make us uh, uh, a bit, uh, for United States, per capita uh, emission, per capita emission, if we count, it is 19 tons, 
per head per year and in india it is 1.3 ton so 19 is 1 almost so 19 times greater uh, per capita emission for united states that is the point so what should they do to uh, sustain much more than this for a sustainable society for a sustainable economy uh, that is only way they can start is to uh, change the technology to change the technology to transform their energy sources from non renewable to renewable and i think europe have already have especially west europe germany has progressed a uh, much more uh, in uh, on this ground basically that is a very important point and now we will i mean in my speech uh, speech actually i am i want to concentrate on a particular thing that is because there are uh, that is a link between uh, millennium development goal with 2030 minute development goal uh, there are 17 development goals with 169 points are there if you go through the policy but this environmentalism leads us to see that the emission of greenhouse uh, gases and fossil fuel burning these are the main issues for develop and that is creating global warming that will create a climate change and climate change is already occurring and there will be a great impact on the whole society but i will concentrate only uh, the impact on agriculture because as a whole one one minute i am taking a time that uh, the question is very familiar i asked him how much is too much how much is too much how much emission can we create or that will the generally uh, climate will be warmed global warming that is climate change now for 1 to 2 degree there will be major impact on eco ecosystems and species increase in heat waves droughts floods spread of infectious diseases this is uh, this book uh, this is from uh, oxford university book uh, global warming and i i i am I, i want to show this book uh, this is very important this global warming and written by mark maslin he wrote it in 2007 that spread of infectious diseases so and uh, now we are in a covid 19 situation so we know uh, what is what could be the impact so uh, another is 2 to 3 degree centigrade it is total major loss in coral reef system large impact on agriculture water resources health there are like this the uh, ice will uh, melt the sea surface temperature uh, sea surface will in uh, sea level will rise like this now the thing is that the you know there is a threshold uh, term threshold it called threshold limit now when this threshold limit cross the pattern of weather will change and agriculture till date uh, in asia africa and latin america and whole country that is dependent on and almost 90% dependent on the hydro meteorological system that is the rainfall uh, uh, moisture content of the soil and moisture content of the air all are related green cover there are so many points uh, and uh, land degradation that is um, uh, very important for agricultural uh, practices so uh, in uh, we, we come to a structured uh, point that agriculture will be impacted largely and why i am i want to concentrate on this because we need food without food we cannot survive so we need food and only through agricultural activity we can get this there is no other way we are not hunting gathering society we are no longer in that stage that uh, we are uh, gathering on food or hunting or fishing no we produce our food from land 
and that land and that production is dependent on the rainfall, uh, moisture content of the soil, moisture content of the air, everything. So this is called a, in nature, it is a hydrometeorological system. Now the pattern will change. Pattern will change means that suppose 1000 millimeter rainfall in 30 days. So 30 into 24 hours. And another is 1000 millimeter rainfall within 15 days. <coughs> there will be a difference. There will be a difference. If it is within 10 days, flood will take place. Or everything will be flooded. So from seed to seedling, when seed to seedling, the, it generally takes one, one and a half month type of food we take. Basically one to two months it will take. Within that period, if this happens, all the seedlings will wash washed away. And it will be rotten. We are all acquainted with this. Now if it is in a large scale, in large area, thousands of hectares of land which is engaged in agricultural activities, agricultural production, the certain rainfall pattern has been changed, then we will face a disaster, disaster in food production. So that is very important. And another point is uh, you are acquainted with, that is a monoculture, that is also a part of a paddy, uh, maize, like all these types of food, monoculture, that is another danger. So diversity in food production, diversity in agricultural production, in crop production, that is a very, very important part, which we have to practice. And in this, what do we call? Because, you know, if uh, you ask a peasant margin in our country, in our, especially in our state, 90, over 90% 90 is marginal peasant. Not largely, marginal. So they want to consume and also for a market. For the market, he has a little bit of land. He will, and the whole village and the whole area will produce a single thing, which is maxi, which he, for which he will get, he or she will get the maximum profit from the market. Only that he will produce. <coughs> he will not think to change his, uh, his food habit or anything like that. Uh, just starts like environmentalism. No, that is not his concern because he is fighting for his survival. That is survival economy. Consume, only for consumption he is producing. And excess he is going to market. So there is a very, very important point to make a law, to make an ism, uh, to think over all these things. Uh, over the, this situation. I am not going to the, the statistics, though I have. And uh, I, after this seminar, I, I shall uh, uh, give it to by email to the organizers what we should think about, how much peasants we have in our country, how many peasant families are there, how much labor power has been engaged, uh, what percentage of labor power has been engaged, what is the contribution of the gross domestic product and the scenario. <coughs> Uh, the gross domestic product is decreasing in agriculture during the last two decades. It is decreasing because people are migrating from their villages to the other parts of the country to get the jobs, to get the money. Under this COVID-19 situation, what we saw is disaster as they are coming back to their villages, own villages. So people engage uh, for employment, if you count uh, for the employment scenario from other things, it is very, uh, it is not uh, very hopeful. Under this situation, uh, we have some other malnutrition problems, uh, anemia, anemia problems for the women, peasant women. 50% in India, we have some statistics of FAO, Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. The last report, you will see how many people in India, how many women in India are chronic anemia, uh, animatic. 50%. Can you imagine? <laughs> the scene is much more dangerous. So the, however, I have to conclude uh, through uh, the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. So in the agenda, the, it is very thoughtful. And the total agenda, you can study on that. 
for the agricultural purpose, there are so many issues. Health issues. Health issues are very important. This there education and there are 17 such goals which cover which all our uh, life and livelihood and uh, it is there uh, on uh, the goal two is end hunger achieve food security and improved nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture so promote sustainable agriculture this is written here which could be sustained. Now, there are uh, many uh, opinions on this particular. For sustainable agriculture, that is, some, suppose somebody want, want to work within that agricultural system, with the, say, she or she or the whole family want, wants to live in village, if their income is sufficient to make their life smooth, what he or she would do? In that case, there are uh, certain points, almost uh, 15 points are there. Now, one, there are like narrowing the focus, etc., etc. I am focusing on two certain points because I am under these uh, sustainable development goals, their agendas. Ultimately, it will come to the parliament, India, and we have to make laws. And uh, prior uh, to this period, there was a planning commission, and now it is Niti Ayog. They will decide based on this agenda, based on the focus, uh, development uh, MDG, million, uh, Millennium Development Goals, and the agendas, what should we do in the agricultural sector, in the health sector, in the education, in industry, in energy sec uh, 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 section like energy production like that so i am concentrating on agriculture and you know the nabat is one of the central organization that uh, work only for the development of rural areas and agricultural rural areas farm activities and off farm activities like handicrafts there are various types of varieties of because you know we are a country the varieties of the 22 languages are just scheduled and one uh, more than 180 dialects different food habits different types of weaving different types of weaving. within bengal you will get at least hundreds of weavers different types of weavers one is Tangail, that is mushirabar that is balu so many so many so many that is zonekali that is begum <laughs> from uh, both the bengal so only for from form of weaver there are so many like this, uh, somebody create only the uh, masks, which you use to the, in the cultural uh, performance. Uh, all these are uh, related with the non-farm, off-farm activities, but based on the rural areas, rural production. Uh, from the land production, they are getting their raw materials, like the cotton or the bamboos or the whatever it may. So, Nabat has similar types of programs. I worked with them uh, after my uh, retiring from the university. And uh, I must give uh, on this occasion thanks to the NIRD, National Institute of Rural Development, uh, Rajendra Nagar, Hyderabad, and also NABARD, and also BARD, Bankers Institute of Rural Development, Lucknow. And now it is also in a uh, head center at Bolpur, Shantanikatan, uh, just near about the Vishwabharati near Vishwarati, because Srinikatan is also there. They are doing. So how do they take these things? Only I mentioned certain points. One is institutionalize all the small growers. Because as an individual, a peasant will not be able to apply this goal, these goals. If we ask one peasant that take biodiversity, don't do only paddy, make it a, a horticulture garden, and within the period you get intercropping areas, do it some uh, integrated farming with chickens, with country chickens, with ducks, with goats and pigs, whatever it may be, make an integrated farming. Prepare your own manure, 
uh, fertilizers on your own through azola, through vermicompost, through litters, through excretors of these animals and circulate it within a very small farm. He will not able to do alone because he has only one or two bigas of land, less one or less than one acre of land. But in a group, it is possible. In a village, it is possible. So we have that program in our, in our government, in our laws. There are so many. There are farmers club, FPOs, farmers producers organization, OFPO, off farm producers organization. So categorically, there are three lawful organizations that will be sponsored by the government of India, central government, and also state government. There are certain institutions through which, if they unite, they could get, they could start this type of diversified food production within a village or within certain area where they could produce from seed to seed, they could integrate the whole farming. They could circulate the whole excretors, all ex types of excretors, uh, and through other supports like vermicompost or as well or something like that, mulching. And there are so many processes to integrate the farming by honeybee keeping. They can re increase their production also. There are so many processes, but alone he couldn't do it. But through organizations, through institutions, he could do it or the family, she could do it. That is possible. And the empowerment of women, that is the very, very important. And nowadays we have our particularly, it started from SGSY, you know, all, uh, um, and now it is now under NRLM. Uh, National Rural Livelihood Mission, which is nowadays called Dindayal Antodai Jojana. And in our state, it is called Anandodhara Dhara in West Bengal, State Rural Livelihood Mission, one of the largest projects ever seen in our country. And it is the largest uh, project to organize the village women, the rural women in groups, in self-help groups. And for the self-help groups, they are the largest institutions. They got loans. They got contributions from governments. And everybody has a bank account. There are certain rules. And these are the largest and this is a flourishing organization. They can do everything now, even the marketing. Even the marketing through if one SHG and all the SHGs are organized in cooperatives. It is and now it is a rule today. And these cooperatives can run their organization. They can also organize themselves in farmers club, farmers producer. So there are institutions. <coughs> and through these institutions, they have the credit facilities. Now what is needed is the different types of trainings like mushroom production, like uh, hatching, uh, seed production seedling production, how to increase the production, diversify the production. There are training centers, skill development societies, there, there are skill development schemes are there and government uh, um, contribution also there. Everything is right there. But uh, I worked uh, one for model in uh, creating a model block. There was a government program in different blocks. Ultimately, all are in, declared ultimately the incentive blocks that is the government of West Bengal declared that all the blocks will be intensive block to uh, organize these uh, self-help groups and uh, producers organizations. And I worked uh, um, there uh, three years. A project was there at Hili, Dokkhinde, Nashpur, and there are three other projects also, Nabad. All ta these types are institutionalized. Even the market outlet, that will be promoted. So. Uh, we are talking about nutrition. That is a one point is there in the target. If you saw the nutrition sensitive agriculture and food system by empowering women. Because whatever we talk, but it is a sustainability and environmentalism in the real field, in the last, what is called the last mile communication, the last mile, 
uh, that is very important and one uh, <coughs> during my work in parliament one i am remembering so many important things and i learned so many things that once uh, our that time uh, uh, finance minister was uh, uh, honorable mr dr monmon singh he told one uh, dialogue that when we are talking about one bill one law one line we have to think what will be the implication how one can apply it in a village in arunachal pradesh or in manipur a village woman who have got only the commune uh, community uh, land owner system is there how he or she or the, her family because all matrimonial societies are there in north east you know all how she with along with her family could implement this credit system this institution which we are uh, talking about to building to build up in the villages if they will take care of the environment it will sustain if they do not take the take care of the environment it will not sustain we will all perish so all literate persons living in cities talking so much knowledge by reading books and books and papers writing papers and publishing publish 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 and making our careers no that is not sustainable if we work with that particular lady within the village then it will be sustainable if we whatever we are talking about ultimately the last my last point is that so i do not want to <laughs> uh make uh, the, my speech is much more of a take time because patience is <laughs> going out i think after 3 hour 23 minutes uh it will be non sustainable to continue more thank you very much for offering me to good wishes to all Thank you sir for your valuable insights it was a great pleasure listening to you and i'm sure the participants not only absorbed but also enjoyed your discussion the practical knowledge and experience was vivid throughout your lecture we will now be taking up few questions pl ma'am over to you thank you bhaskar thank you uh, dr Kundu, uh, professor kundu thank you so much for your talk uh, so uh, we have a couple of questions from our listeners the first question come from uh, parthu sharuti shorkar he has two questions in fact the first one is uh, production in this region in in the indian region is dependent upon hydrology but how does the risk of loosening water resources can be minimized <coughs> yes that is very important very important question uh, Uh, because you know uh, recharging of water is very important if we want to uh, you, you all also know all these things that loosening of water means for the cities for all types of construction when we are covering the land the land itself absorb the water the rain water and that is the only recharging points throughout the land and we are reducing all these by road making roads cities etc 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 and we are using uh, <coughs> underground wa water uh, by taking it out for agricultural purposes for fast uh, increasing the agricultural purpose quantity of agricultural production that is also not sustainable only thing is that if we uh, make water shed programs that is we can preserve the water over the ground that could be uh, sustainable up a very long time so there is a uh, rule also you can get everything in the indian constitution and indian law that is one is to find that for one acres of land you make 5% of that land a pond 15 feet there is a measurement also right 15 feet deep uh, make a water 5% taking 5% of the land then go on through like this so you can arrest 
you can make a drainage system you can arrest the water in that particular region to increase the soil moisture and maintain the ph level of the soil and other parameters i'm not going to details to maintain your uh, balance that if certain there are certain uncertainty in rainfall you can use that water also that is the most important thing and in cities there is no future i do not see any future because we are covering everything to dig the actually this answer will go too much time because you see if we want to decrease the quantity of spm suspended particulate matters respirable particulate matters like uh, pm 10 pm 25 all these things we have to cover up all these roads and uh, footpaths and everything and spray water from where we will take the water from underground or uh, nearest or whatever it may be so when rain will fall all the waters will go away from all this particular region and it will through some drain it will go again to the ocean that is a natural course yes but the recharging of the underground water aquifers is much more hampered for these construction and this is all any more i don't yes want sir to... uh... So there is one one uh, one question. Uh, what is the impact of uh, high level aluminium on children and also on adults? This question is posed by Sanjay Bishwas. Ah, so uh, metal toxicity. Metal toxicity is very uh, harmful. Uh, you know there is a one point, <coughs> one um, very famous uh, Greek philosopher. He told. that everything in this world is toxic it depends only on the amount only on the quantity so uh, not only aluminum all the heavy metal toxicity and light metal toxicity metal toxicity is a very a very um, important factor huh we are uh, we are trying to reduce it but you know there are certain problems and you know all these things because if we change this this use there will be another toxicity so how to avoid how to avoid because unless it unless it mixed with the food and take in intake uh, a pathway through our metabolic process this metal uh, toxicity or whether it is aluminum or whatever it may be it must be in a particular organic molecular mode otherwise our body will not take it but if it is within that mode it will be taken and that is a much more problem prolonged contact that is cooking with all these i mean through these items their oxides will form and it is being readily formed there are so many other problems are there and for children not only for children children are men may very much prone to the toxic uh, uh, effect for this all types of metal toxicity there are even if you see the aqua guards and everything they are also uh, selling their products that is to arrest the toxic uh, metals uh, toxic metal another arrest the metals uh, through their uh, different types of filters because drinking water is very much important but one thing is also very dangerous that in an uh, un, we are <coughs> now used to take all um, uh, this type of aqua guard or what this type of water whatever it may be but certain time as a micronutrient it is necessary also it is not that all toxic so there are it, is, it depends on the quantity now it is not possible to taste all the food item like jam or butter or whatever everything there is a process because in our lab in jadavpur university i was work uh, i was working with uh, metallurgy department uh, and particularly on this subject toxicity we have we have received that drug you know bhutan government products regularly in within in jadavpur university and we have to test it that toxicity is permissible limit for ps permissible within the permissible limit or outside the permissible limit. only then they will get a certificate for export or whatever it may be. so it is a regular process also within our uh, 
law and uh, domain. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, I would now um, hand over to Professor Bhaskar Borman for the next round of session. We have now come to the end of the program and it is time for giving the vote of thanks. I would now introduce Dr. Keka Dr. Rai, head of the department in the Department of History, who is also the convener of a college's research committee, to deliver the vote of thanks for today's webinar. Ma'am, over to you. We have come to the end of the program. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, all of you? Yes, and now it is my turn yes, to deliver the vote of thanks. I extend my heartiest gratitude Hello, ma'am. I think ma'am is disconnected. I can phone it. Yes, ma'am, you audible. Yes, yes, audible. Yes, audible. Hello, am I audible? Yes, yes. Yes, ma'am, yes, audible. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. We have come to the end of the program. And now it is my turn to deliver the vote of thanks. I extend my heartiest gratitude to the honorable president and members of the governing body, the internal and external members of, the oh, I'm of our college for extending their support to make this event a success. I convey my sincere thanks to our principal, Dr. Ratnagar Pani, the vice I'm extremely sorry for this uh, technical glitch. I think uh, there is some problem on her part. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Am I audible? Now I'm audible? Yes. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Right now, yes. Yes. I have to thank our principal, Dr. Ratna Kotpani, the vice principal, Professor P. K. Roy, the Barsa, Professor J. Mukherjee, and our IQSC coordinator, Dr. Shonali Roy, for encouraging us and extending their support for organizing the webinar. 
I have to thank our distinguished speakers, Dr. Shorish Jha, Department of Political Science, Ravindra Bharati University, Dr. Orijit Kumar Das, Molecular Biologist, Department of Veterinary Medicine, University of Cambridge, Professor Obhijit Kumdu, BIT Mesra, for finding time from their busy schedule to be with us and illuminate us with their informative and engaging talk. I would also like to thank the participants without whose enthusiastic presence the program would not have been possible. Further, I would like to thank Professor Shuparna Ganguly, Department of Economics, for conducting the interactive sessions, Professor Piali Shet, the convener, and Professor Bhaskar Bordon, the joint convener, Sinimai Pradhan, the head clerk, Sri Shonjit Karwal, the accountant, for taking trouble in making the event successful. Finally, I thank all my colleagues teaching and non-teaching staff and our dear student participants for extending their wholehearted support. Company for providing us with the entire technical support to make this program a success. Stay home, stay safe, and good night. Thank you so much, everyone. I wish you all a very good evening again and a good night. Also, uh, also thanks a lot for your patient hearing and your graceful presence virtually, though. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.